Project. Um, well, uh... Hello and welcome to episode 27 of the Project Umbrella podcast, a Resident Evil Revelations 2 special where we'll be dissecting each episodic release of this new game from Capcom. I'm here to introduce to you all the next step in the Resident Evil chronology, as you may have listened to on previous podcasts. I am patiently awaiting for the disc release to play Revelations 2, and therefore I will be absent from these episodic podcasts. I know, share your tears, people, share your tears. Um, but what we <laughs> But you are left in the best possible hands. So joining the podcast to guide you through the episodic releases, we have the Batman. Hello. We have Star Tyrant. Hello. We have Rombie. Hello. And we have George Trevor. Hi there. Revelations 2 has not actually been released yet at the point of recording, and none of us have had the opportunity to play it. So as you will listen, it will be as Capcom intended, shall we say, <laughs> so that people can speculate and put theories across as how we want the game to end up. And back when we do the full podcast, when I've played it, and the game has been released to the masses in disc format, we can listen back and actually see how close we were to our predictions, and perhaps our expectations were too high. That's Neptune's prediction. Let's find out how that transpires. So, um, what I will do now is hand you over to the Batman, who will guide you through what the first episode has had to offer and I will join you when it's released in disc in March Why did it open? I didn't do anything. Where have I been taken? So just to clarify then, we're recording this several days after episode 1 came out. Episode 2 isn't available yet. So before we get right into it then, what's everyone's general thoughts on how it looks and how it plays compared to Revelations 1 and Resident Evil 6? I think visually, I think people have been a bit hard on it, because although it's not the best looking game of all time, it's perfectly functional. And I was quite surprised that the, the frame rate was as high as it was, although I'm aware the PS4 version has frame rate issues in Barry's campaign. The gameplay itself is actually pretty good. The controls lean more toward Biohazard sticks, but without the sliding or the, the, like the dodge leaping. I think the dodge mechanic in this is possibly worse than the original revelations. I just don't think it works. It just never seems to work, but that's maybe just because I need to pump skills in it. The AI mechanic I just on harder difficulties it is just awful I mean the the flamethrower room with Claire and Moira is just an exercise in frustration you got to keep swapping the characters and they'll get distracted and whoever idea it was to not have an AI character be able to defend themselves unless you've unlocked the skill they, they need to depart Capcom very quickly apart from that I'm quite impressed with it I was uh, mm, a big critic 
of this game even before it was released and I'm pleasantly surprised to say I had a good time with it and it does something that a biohazard game hasn't done in a long time and that is atmosphere mm. it, even in the prison it, it builds a strong atmosphere and it's quite unsettling even if it is a more action-packed title but the forest as linear as it is is brilliant and and that's the kind of direction I need to go in I think so pleasantly surprised the story needs to really get going but there's three chapters left for that so yeah more positive than negative at the minute yeah pretty much the same thing i mean like the issues i had kind of that dodge mechanic is really poor um as well like i just i just think it's pointless and the other thing that i really just didn't like was the whole bleeding aspect not so much the idea of it but the fact that like your entire screen gets covered with blood making it already difficult situation even more difficult because you're like i don't have any herbs right now i'm trying to find a herb i'm trying to defend myself and i can't even see what i'm defending against <laughs> I was quite pleasantly surprised to find that grain filter that I'd seen in the preview version has been removed, which is really good. It actually made the game look better without it. So I think that's a plus for the at least the graphics. I know they're pretty basic, as people have been talking about, but yeah, I don't think they're that bad. I like the difficulty in general. Like I found like the starting difficulty pretty good, but obviously a lot of that has to do with what you can unlock and the perks and all that sort of system. And so it probably gets easier the more you unlock. I've only played it through once, so um and yeah probably the same thing about the story that it, it's starting to open up and it really did feel like it was just starting by the time the episode's ending which i'm not sure if that's a good thing or not i think at this stage when you especially if they're trying to get people to play this that haven't played it before perhaps having a little bit more story at the start might have been a good idea but for long time fans it's probably not such a big deal yeah i don't have to say a lot i, I completely agree with everything sean said particularly about the atmosphere that's what has stood it apart for me when I mentioned, uh, you know, enjoying it more than most Resident Evil games since RE4, it really does provide a great atmosphere. Exactly what I, you know, what I want from RE. Yeah, dodge mechanics seems a bit ineffectual. The AI is appalling. Rombi mentions the grain effect because I was, I don't know again if this goes back to the problems I've been having with the download, but mine seems to have a grainy effect. I don't know if that's my poor HD telly or the fact I'm using the PS3 version. Well, I'm interested to know because you were talking about, I don't know if we've talked about this yet or in here, but you were talking about having your, your problems with playing it and you were saying you played this version offline that was like the demo version and the version I played was the demo had the grain on it and in the menus there is these unlockable filters which obviously are a special feature that you eventually unlock and I'm assuming that grain filter is supposed to be one of them. The version I was playing when I played the preview version as a single player was the Xbox One version so it wasn't even the PS3 version at that stage and the grain was really heavy it's really noticeable the fact it's not there it's really noticeable now um, so yeah I'd be interested to know I very much noticed it when I got that limited access to the full game when it when it was working briefly uh, last night and particularly in the dark area constant like you know buzzing like pixelization but now going back to the game i've generally enjoyed it uh, quite promising for me anyway i'm pretty similar to yourselves when i booted it up the first thing that struck me was it doesn't look anywhere near as bad as what i was expecting you know it doesn't look spectacular but it certainly doesn't look bad and like you say the prison was quite atmospheric even though a lot of the textures were copy and pasted over from resident evil 6 and it's a great shame that you still can't interact with your environments anymore you know you've got blood-stained gurneys paperwork sprawled on the desks remnants of torture experiments yet you get no descriptions about what these things were about having said that one thing I did like about the prison was how it was actually a small hub area with differing ways round it, which was quite nice and unexpected. I also quite like the fact that when you kill the enemies, they don't automatically dissolve into a big pile of bullets. Um, so, so far anyway, for me, it seems solid enough without being spectacular. I think there's little bits here and there dotted around either side of some of the forts that pleasant surprises like Batman mentions. Yeah, no, no ammunition with dead enemies I've really liked. And also for me, certainly the prison section felt like the least linear Resident Evil game I've played for some time. You know, without using the map and without having the tutorials on, I got lost on the first kind of walkthrough. And, 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 and yeah, for the first time, for some time, I, I kind of had to sort of look around and, and double back and think where I was going. So I, yeah, I definitely enjoyed that aspect as well. It's amazing to see how much has been lifted from uh, The Last of Us, though. The stealth mechanic is identical, like absolutely identical. And uh, throwing when bricks. You yeah, and with bricks and Natalia's uh, her ability to be able to see enemies through wall is exactly the same as Last of Us listen mechanic, where you have to press it, hold the button down, you can see enemies through walls. The combining stuff that Barry can do with his, you know, with his backpack and that 
is exactly the same as the stuff that mm-hmm. uh, Joel can do in The Last of Us. You know, you can either choose to use like uh, alcohol as a disinfectant or to help create like a petrol bomb kind of thing and all that. It's identical. It's actually shameless how similar it is. <laughs> You know, I'm I'm sure Naughty Dog will be, uh, you know, almost doing a lawsuit if they actually cared. It is frighteningly similar. Even some of the animations for, like, the stealth, you know, when you're actually crouched, it even looks lifted to me. It's so similar. So much suffering. You don't even know what to be afraid of yet. Chapter one, then, is called The Penal Colony. So if we start with Claire's scenario, obviously she wakes up with this bracelet strapped to her wrist. What do we think's going on there? I actually have no theories on what the game's about at the minute, actually, or why Claire was selected. No, I actually haven't. I have nothing. And I was trying to think which virus it could be. And obviously, I've, we've discussed this before we recorded that some of us aren't privy to the massive spoiler leak that's <laughs> occurred this week. Um, so I don't actually know what the viruses are. Obviously, we knew the Ouroboros thing by the end of the game, but I can't piece what what monsters they are. So are we thinking that the specific type of enemy and virus here, you know, is going to be particularly related to the fact that it's it's Claire rather than any other particular character that's that's been kidnapped. You know, an, an enemy from her past or or is it going to be an enemy that specifically relates to Claire's timeline through the series? Well, we don't know if the armed soldiers at the start are attacking Terrasave or if they've stormed Terrasave's offices specifically to get Claire because they do mention her by name. Yeah. Mm. Oh, they, they, yeah, I think she's the only name they really draw out from that list, isn't it? She, they, Claire Redfield, we're, you know, we're looking for you. Yeah, um, Moira just feels like baggage, to be honest. Like, she, she was there, so they nabbed her as well. I was going to say, it's not just obviously the two of them. There are other people from Tira Save there that we've already seen. We've the woman that gets killed in front of them, basically. It's another member that Claire talks about. So, obviously, so then, there's been multiple people kidnapped. But, I mean, if you're thinking Claire was the primary target, then you have to assume that it's to get at Chris. I can't, I can't think that the work Claire does now, being part of TerraSave, would make her that many enemies. So Are we talking about getting at Chris in lieu of what's happened in the wake of Resident Evil 5, basically? Yeah, I would think so, because this does feel like it. it is almost like a, a mini-sequel to 5. And then, you know, and the fact that they were so quick to throw in the, you know, we've got an Ouroboros reference even before the second chapter's finished. So it's clearly a spiritual successor to that game's storyline, which, you know, say what you will about what you think the enemy might be. I think nearly everybody knows now. The only other thing that struck me about the intro was Natalia's name was on that list, but yeah. she's obviously not a member of TerraSave, so... Is it just like a guest list? Yeah. So, was she captured as well, or... From playing the game, it comes across to me, anyway, that Natalie seems to have a long history with this island. Mm. But then why would she be on that TerraSave list? You get a glimpse of her in Claire's game. The six-month thing, as we find out near the end, is quite interesting that she appears very briefly. So, yeah, with that time difference, so that would have been six months prior to turning up on that beach. Yeah. The time difference jump between Claire and Barry was a bit of a shocker, as I have to admit, when I was playing Barry's scenario, I assumed... His game was maybe a couple of days or a week after Claire's. I guess there was a time difference because I guessed in advance that the enemies Barry were fighting were the enemies from Claire's campaign. But like, you know, in the 28 days later style, yeah. that they'd actually start to... So I was thinking maybe like two or three weeks. I wasn't expecting six months. <laughs> I must admit, I did wonder why the enemies had suddenly changed if this was only a few days after Claire's campaign. I mean, now that we know six months have passed, uh, and I know it's nitpickety, but would that flame thing really still be firing? Probably no, unless it's got, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it got a gas, gas pipeline running into the <laughs> island. It does give you a note too that things that you do in Claire's part of the game will impact on berries on to a certain degree. Most of that seems to be enemies and the odd... Like if you use the flamethrower and you destroy the uh, blades in the room, you can't get the extra item that's inside. Yeah, they've, they've said something to do with where you shoot enemies in Claire's campaign creates, is it new weak points for Barry's or... So I presume that applies to the Revenants, is it? But I don't know how that works because obviously the section that that's in is not an area that Claire goes yeah, to. Right. And I know the one thing that does impact on is um, like you get those little pools of um, like they explode basically if, if you shot certain enemies and they know. died left there. And those appear still in Barry's campaign, which obviously is months later. If you get close to them, they kind of bloat up and then explode. So, kind of weird. So that's a mechanic that's pretty much lifted from Code Veronica, where you know, like once you'd played it through the first time when you were going back, you knew you could leave certain items for later in the game. 
Oh, but that's also going back to Resident Evil 2, the minutes of the zapping system. Yeah, that's true, yeah. What did you think about the enemies in general? As I have to admit, I was fully expecting the Afflicted and the Rotten to just play like a Ganada or a Magini, but with a different skin. Mm. I still I, find them pretty pretty bland. I mean, I like them. I, I actually quite like them. Yeah, you know, I didn't. I didn't kind of put two and two together and and, and work out why they, you know, th- th- they were particularly different in uh, in in Barry's campaign. But um, what's effectively, you know, a lower budget game. I I really like the design. I thought they were pretty pretty good. I didn't mind them too much. The only thing that I disappointed with them is the lifted animations from the enemies in four. So like the big guys with the sort of mallets, they are lifted exactly from the hammer wielding enemy in the labs from Resident Evil Four. You know the running animations identical and. But that's, um, that's this game across the board. I mean, we talked about this previously. Yeah. There's stuff from Lost Planet, there's stuff from other Resident Evil games in here. So I guess it can't be that surprising. But I didn't, I didn't mind them too much. But they they are uninspiring, if nothing else. They're not the <laughs> thing I remember the most about what I've played so far. I Obviously, think it's the same issue for me as well. The, the Revenants are visually interesting, and I quite like the hit point that you need to look through like Natalia's view will show you where the hit point is I quite like that it's just a shame that the Revenant section where you've got to get the crane going I just think just like you said last time Rob it's uh, it's just one of those shitty bottlenecked areas where they just throw enemies at you and the Revenant seem to be an enemy that work better when the environment suits them more like the forest bit in the dark when they sort of appear I think mm. it's a brilliant section it's really good I must admit that when walking through the woods in the darkness with Barry, knowing the revenants were out there, left me experiencing a touch of fear that I've not had with a Resident Evil game in years. <laughs> I even just tried to run through the forest at one point, and they just get on all fours and straddle past you at speed with this curiously awkward, stilted movement. And then more of them appear, because if you take them on one at a time, it's okay, but then when you get two or even three of them... It becomes a lot harder to deal with. So yeah, the revenants, I think, were the best thing about the enemies in the in the first two chapters. So are we to assume these afflicted are the test subjects that Spencer gave to Alex that he mentions in the files in Lost in Nightmares? Yeah, because having played Lost in Nightmares recently, I was really thinking back to that file where Spencer, you know, sort of exasperates about the amount of test subjects. I think he even mentions thousands, doesn't he? It's got quite a high number that he's, you know, that they're constantly going through, churning through at the island. And so I was really thinking back to, yeah, h- how much of that file they might relate back to. Yeah, it's got to be it. I don't know, I've only just thought of that until now. I've not really. It's funny because obviously the infamous spoiler link leak this week. Oh. But of course, knowing what scraps we do know, I mean, most of us on this cast have tried to remain spoiler free. But I will just clarify that we do know that the villain is Alex Wesker, thanks to the leak. But in fairness, I think we all suspected her anyway. She was really the only logical choice, given the hints Capcom have dropped in the past. But aside from her identity, we know nothing else about the levels, the plot, or how the game plays out. Would that be fair? Yeah. 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 Let's yeah. okay with that. Said the poor lost soul as she lamented her fate. I am the overseer. Fear requires an audience and a conductor. I was so sort of angry at myself that I, I found out the identity of the villain before the game revealed it, and so as such, I haven't thought yet about connecting that to the Lost in Nightmares files. But what you've said is actually really good, and yeah, that that would be all. The, all these afflicted would be the test subjects that Spencer muses about sending. So the DNA of this game runs certainly through Resident Evil Five. Uh, lost in nightmare stuff. This is the only thing I think about this that, is, that I find quite interesting is that obviously if Spencer knows that um, Alex has taken off, but the, where these test subjects were being tested on is probably this island, then he knows where Alex is. <laughs> so I'm a little bit bemused by this fact. Unless uh, unless he was sending them to a place and then Alex was moving them on from there herself. That's always a possibility as well, I guess. I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested to know if picking out Claire is specific because of the test subject history, because they, they there might be some more justification to it, or if it's just more test subjects and they were just looking for new people to put on the island. I don't know. It might be too much to hope for, but with there being files back in, in the game, you know, that you can read in real time and uh, and collect uh, like the older style. Uh, yeah, so certainly hoping perhaps there might be one that relates back specifically to, to that time, you know, that, that relationship with Spencer between Alex. So far, the files that I've read and what you guys think seem, I mean, I'm pleased that they're there, but they seem a little generic. You know, there's one that seems just, you know, a bland version of Jessica's or, you know, Lisa's, you know, comments to Jessica about, you know, being lost in, in an experimental lab and pining for her mother. 
I just compare them to uh, how Five started, because the files in the beginning of Resident Evil 5 were of similar ilk. They didn't really have all that much interesting about them until you start getting to the Plaga files about a third of the way in. And then it's, by it's the a... end of the game, the files are brilliant. So I'm hoping that as we get more and more into the story, the files will ramp up suitably so. And I've not seen, I've not unlocked any of them yet, any of the secret files, so I don't know whether they contain any more juicy bits. It's all scene setting too. I mean, essentially a lot of the files are in a location where a lot of it is scraps of notes, information about the prisoners and so forth. So I kind of, yeah, I kind of agree. I kind of understand why the files are the way they are. I'm a bit wary that they haven't got any firm dates, though considering how much of a pain in the ass the first Revelations game was to put together, surely this game's plot can't be as complicated and complex as the first one. Especially considering it's got such a hard set date after 5 and... Well, I assume before six. <laughs> and the secret files, you can unlock the first three on this episode. Um, I won't mention them if you've not got them, but obviously you need to find all the tower emblems, all the Kafka drawings, and all the insect larvae, which adds a nice bit of replayability. You know, it's nice to have the files back in the game, but with the bonus of being able to find the extra hidden ones. They're quite well hidden, them, them things. Yeah. I cannot find the last Kafka drawing at all. I've got five, and I've done like three playthroughs now, and I'm struggling to find the last one. And the insect lava are nearly impossible. I think I've got two. I haven't even tried. I didn't even realise there was anything until like partway through. I just saw one of the emblems, and I was like, ah, oh, there's hidden stuff in here. <laughs> <laughs> so I completely missed pretty much most of them, I think, the first time. What do you make of the uh, partner switching system? Because I'm just not liking it at all at this point, I'm afraid. Yeah, I despise it. It's, as, as I said to you guys after I played the trial version, it's pretty, it's pretty much the same thoughts. I, it hasn't changed to one point, but I find it annoying and frustrating and very slow. And as we were talking about as well, the AI partners are pretty useless independently anyway. So but The so. sad thing is there's, there's aspects of it which would really lend itself to a, a good co-op experience. Like I like the fact that like Moira can do the strong takedowns. So, you know, you, you can blind an enemy with a torch, Claire can knock an enemy down, and then you can do a crowbar finisher. And as a multiplayer sort of co-op experience, it's it's quite good. Mm. As a single-player experience where you have to swap to do, like, you know, swap three times to do that motion effectively, it's just a pain in the ass. And on harder difficulties... That I said at the beginning of the of the cast that flamethrower right, flamethrower room on the harder difficulty I think it's survival it's just awful so you run in as Claire you turn the flamethrower at that point you switch to Moira to turn the, the fire on then you need to run and do the the crowbar door opening animation but if at any point she gets hit she'll stop doing that so you have to swap back to her to then set her going again then swap back to Claire so you can cover her but at that point the moment you switch back to Claire she could be running into an enemy who will then kill you instantly. It's just, like earlier on, I was doing Barry on the survival setting, and it was the bit, the crane section at the end, and I just happened to press the character swap button as he ran into a revenant with low health and got instantly killed. And I just think, you know, that's appalling mechanics. There's no, there's nothing I can do about that. I don't understand the thinking behind it, really, because it's just not fun to do. It's the same reason I don't like the bleeding aspect either for the same thing, because you can switch back to a character who's been damaged and they're bleeding all over the place, and you're like, well, this isn't helpful. Like, you've got to turn and figure out a way to try and fix the situation. It's an added annoyance on an already difficult system, basically. We talked about atmosphere, and it takes you out with the experience as well, mm. because you're walking down these dark corridors in this creepy prison with no ammo, yet you have to physically switch to Moira or Claire or probe all the corners to try and find little scrounges of ammo. It's just a pain in the ass. There's just no in- Enjoyment in it. Mm. I think with a lot of these things, it, they're, they're just sort of almost gimmicks that you know they're stuck on Capcom trying to be a bit different, you know, trying to progress the series forward, but not actually thinking how are these things really going to affect the gameplay in a beneficial way. Yeah, with, with the bleeding, it just becomes an annoyance. See, with, with the AI, it's just there as a feature, but doesn't really enhance the gameplay in any way. Yeah, the, the bleeding stuff reminded me of how much I hated it in Outbreak. Nothing about it improves the game; it just irritates you. And any, mm. any and a mechanic that irritates is a mechanic that doesn't work. Mm. So obviously this game brings Claire back. Chronologically, it's the first time we've seen her since Degeneration? Yep. yep. Obviously there's been a lot of fan outcry that Alison Carr has been replaced. But what do we think of this older, wiser Claire Redfield? Do we think she's still recognisable, or, or do we not like the changes? And I'm not talking about her face. I was I was really, really vocal about Alison Court's departure because she was like the last voice of the original troop that yeah. are now gone. On Biohaze, we seem to think that it is now 
the actress who plays Lightning from Final Fantasy XIII and also played Jessica in Revelations. To be honest, I miss Alison, but I don't think she's bad. And mm. I think she is recognisable as Claire. Like, I play it and I actually think, yeah, I'm playing as Claire again. She works. Yeah, her personality is intact, I think. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd agree. I was mindful of that. I'm a big fan of the keeping the original voice actors, so I could quite happily be very critical. I'm, I'm critical of the change, but no fair play. She, she's done well. It does sound similar. You, you do imagine, It doesn't certainly take it away. You don't sort of, you know, it, it doesn't feel as, as if it's sort of alien to the character. It, it feels, it sounds quite similar. And what about Barry? Oh, no, not not for him at all. I'm awful, I think. No, I think he's pretty good. Well, I just, I mean, I'm just, I think I'm pining for, you know, the remake. I mean, they were never going to go back to Ed Smarr and it's, you know, so, so much time has passed. And I think their policy now, Capcom, of just not going with agency actors and just going for the cheapest buck, really. And it, and, it, and it's a shame. It's a much, it's such a beloved character. I think it's such a shame. It's funny because Barry's appearance and voice seems to be modelled on the original biohazard and not the remake yeah this is the issue i was talking about last time there's an inconsistency of idea here where the story i suppose needs to continue on from the remake version but all the references and the way the character types are taken as far as at least barry and his background and his versionisms are concerned it comes from the idea of how he was in the original playstation version which just does just doesn't mesh very well I was just going to say, his model, you would think, would be easier to lift from, like, the higher quality model from Biohazard 5 and just change that. But they've created, like, a totally new one. You know, his hairstyle and, and like, his facial hair and everything are much more in line with an old artwork, I remember. Mm. Um, you know, like, the, the cast... Yeah. The cast stars cast drawings that they did for the, I think it was the director's cut manual or something from that one. But then they've added in obviously the later consistency, like his gun is the stars model, you know, that yeah. they've got from the, from the remake and other versions that were basically existed since Resident Evil 3. And yeah, there's a weird juxtaposition going on. And what about Moira? Oh, potty mouth. <laughs> I mean, all joking aside, well, obviously there must have been a specific decision at some point in the development that they were going to have her swear continually. And and also, I, it's, as a parent, I, it really winds me up that she's so disrespectful to, to her dad. <laughs> yeah. And she calls him Barry. I hate the way she calls him Barry and not dad. The thing with Moira is that the language and, and shitty lines aside, <laughs> in the quieter moments, I actually think she isn't bad. She works. The, mm. the, the the brief exchange where Claire tells her about getting a gun and it obviously refers back to this family tragedy, which we all think is a suicide or an accidental death of Polly, who's a younger sister. She's actually really good at that moment and she's good in other moments, but it's just they just seem to give her the most poorly written dialogue that is, you know, curse filled and. Oh, I, it just. I think those references in the in the other bits, and it's not just her, but also the ones that get given to Claire and Barry and stuff. Like they want to create this kind of fan service and reverence to older stuff, and again, the Resident Evil One dialogue from the PlayStation One version. But again, it's the sort of thing that takes me out. Like those dialogue scenes, as you're talking about with, with the gun and stuff, they I find they feel consistent to the environment and the situation. But then you get these little jokey lines, and it kind of almost takes me out of it a bit. Yeah, even though I know what the joke is, but. Claire sandwich is terrible. Barry saying, who's the master of unlocking now? Awful. But Claire picking up a gun and saying, this is more reliable than any person, is actually really cool. That's actually a good one. I quite like that. Because it's not obvious. If you've not played oh, Code Veronica... I in, just realised, oh, yeah. If you've not played Code Veronica recently, you wouldn't realise that that's a homage to that the first, you know, one of the first moments with Steve. Oh, well, that just hit me as you said it, Stars. I yeah. didn't realise at the time. Yeah. I should mention, actually, that uh, Capcom have taken a different approach with their localization process this time round. Even though DeSato wrote the overall scenario, the English script has been written separately by native English speakers. Yeah, well, I saw that comment because these things that are references for the English language stuff are not in the Japanese one because yeah. they weren't in the Japanese one. Ironically, this was done to make the dialogue sound more natural. But the bits yeah. that they've added that probably aren't the translated bits seem to be the bits that we're talking about are mostly taking us away from it. Like, But like you just pointed out, all they've done is listen to the badly mistranslated scripts in previous games and thought, yeah, let's just chuck in a load of references from them. 
you know, which renders the whole thing completely pointless, really. Yes, it's fan service and people will love it, and some of them do raise a smile, but I don't want them to overdo it. I mean, episode one alone has had more than enough, so God knows the sort of, what sort of crap Barry's going to be coming out with by the time we get to episode four. The Clay, the Clay Thomas thing is an interesting kind of dynamic because I don't like the reference, but I do like the follow-up where basically it sounds like Barry's told... As I said last time, Barry's told this story to so many people because he thought it was so <laughs> hilarious. I do kind of like that, though, because I think that is something that is a character thing. Like That's something that someone would actually do. They're like, I, this, this time I told this awesome joke, I'm going to tell it over and over again to death till everyone's heard it. <laughs> Chill. So, yeah, and that's all. And you always get the inf- inf- feeling that that is why Claire says it, because she knows she's with Barry's daughter. And it's yeah. kind of jokey interlude that they she can say to break the tension. But that's the but context Moira's thing. I think is a bit weird. Is that it, if it was in a, another situation, it probably would be okay. But right now, it's kind of a bit weird. And it's like they've set up this entire like trap room with the compressed, you know, the garbage compressed for the entire purpose of making that line work. Yeah, 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 <laughs> it is, yeah. I do quite like his relationship with Natalia, though. I think the conversations they have with each other are quite good, actually. The start of it's a bit forced, like it felt a little bit awkward at first because obviously she just starts talking to him and like there's no real context. But later on it gets better. It's just, but it has to start somewhere. So it's, I, I kind of understand it, but it's a little yeah. bit uneven at first. I found the beginning a little bit cheesy, like you say. But yeah, I suppose you, you're right. It has, to, it has to start somewhere, and, it, and it, it's a nice. It's, it, it's going to hopefully prove to be a you know very interesting relationship between the two of them. And I think it's fair to say that she's going to tie to the plot a lot in this. Mm. Yeah. Her bracelet's red, isn't it? Which mm. implies that she is, you know, beyond rescue. So we've talked a bit about the prison. Um, obviously, we're on an island again. We've been on an island a few times in Resident Evil, but I find this quite refreshing in that we actually get to walk around outside. I mean, yes, it might be linear, but, you know, we get to explore the coastline and the logging camps, and we get to go through the forest, and I think that's really good because previous island scenarios, you know, Rockfort Island could have just been a small community in the middle of nowhere. You know, Sheena Island was just basically in a city, and dead aim we get taken straight underground and we we never get to explore the island at all so i find this scenario on revelations 2 to be really refreshing in that respect i was really disappointed that we, we spend the whole of the first sort of two chapters trying to get to the radio tower and then when we get there it's in a cut scene i was really looking forward to climbing to the top and sort of surveying the island and getting like a preview of where we're going to go in the next chapters and that, oh, that would have done it's done in a pissing cut scene yeah that would have been brilliant that, that would have been really good I'm going to say that it, it, it is an environment. I mean, yeah, the closest we've had previously was bits of Resident Evil 4, and even then it didn't really feel like you were too outside a lot of the time. It still felt like enclosed areas because you didn't have those sorts of scenic scapes of, like, coastlines and stuff. You basically were in a forest, and you didn't have a precursor to where you were entering to. You just were there. So, like, the stuff with the castle and, like, the mines and all that sort of stuff, it was just narrow. It's another replacement for a narrow corridor because you have no context of what's around it. But this changes it because, yeah, you're saying it's like going on the coastline, you see stuff, you know you're on an island, but you you go inland, you come back out to the coast again. It's a bit, quite a bit different. I, I would agree with what Batman said about it, uh, you know, being generally scared for the first time in, in a while in a Resident Evil game. It, it was quite linear, but I enjoyed the fact that the forest was so wide. It didn't quite feel as linear as, as, as it actually was structurally because it was quite a wide kind of gameplay area to wander around and the, the dark and, and the mist and then hearing the noises, it, you know, similar to the, the monsters were making, kind of similar to when you would creep around a corner in the mansion and you would just hear the kind of the croaking noise of a hunter around a corner. Um, I really like the idea that you know you can hear kind of that, that that spooky insidious noise before you kind of come across what's making it. These freaks had some of the same symptoms as Ouroboros. Robo Robo? It's a virus some bad people used in Africa a couple of years ago. Question is, how did it get out here? So in terms of general plot, I mean, I know it's early days but, and we've only played the first quarter of the game and we don't really have a lot to go on. But obviously Barry mentions Ouroboros. What's interesting to me is Wesker perfected Ouroboros, but he didn't have any, uh, well, apart from the Reaper, which I think was a secondary infectant anyway, he didn't have any Ouroboros-based B.O.W.s. But now all of a sudden we have these revenants. So is it safe to say that someone has taken Wesker's work and tried to further perfect it, perhaps to try and make more people compatible to its effects? But then if this is Alex Wesker, then how has she gotten access to Ouroboros? And how does it tie into this mysterious immortality virus? I'm still convinced it's someone to do with the clean-up operation after the events. 
in Resident Evil 5, personally. And that ties back into this somehow, but how that is, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's too simplistic for Capcom, but you, you just think with, you know, the, the, the purpose, all the resources, everything on the island was gearing towards presumably the immortality virus. Yeah, that these infectants, secondary infectants or BOWs, would be um yeah the, the remnants of uh, the experimentations or uh you know like the blobs were in lost in nightmares with spencer's progenitor experiments these guys would would be the you know the offspring of this immortality virus are you thinking there's gonna like there's there's a second sort of virus at, at play here you know an ouroboros thing or well possibly because i honestly wasn't expecting ouroboros to come back i thought it was just going to be one of these things we'd never hear from again after resident evil 5 in all honesty I'm kind of not surprised because it had quite... I mean, one of the things about it in, in Resident Evil 5 was essentially the variety it provided an enemy design a lot of the time. So it was a dynamic that they could always bring back, which they it is more interesting than the one we got in Resident Evil 6, isn't it? I think you can probably point fingers to it being the progenitor again. The afflicted... I don't really know what connection they would have with previous progenitor stuff, but the rotten remind me very much of like the undead in Spencer's basement and things like that. You know, test subjects that have just been left to rot and so they're just animated corpses basically. As I, I don't know what the spoiler leaks have said so people are probably listening to this cast saying, oh but I know it's the T. Veronica spliced with the GC and you know and this new blah 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 so no, in terms of viruses I know there's been a lot of talk of Alexia being in, you know, being in the game but I think they were generally bullshit rumours but there's no properties that the uh, enemies display that would lead me to believe it's the T. Veronica at all So apart from Ouroboros then the only other thing we have in terms of plot at this stage is this apparent six month time difference between Claire's game and Barry's game so are we thinking that's significant at all or just random? Has any of the trailers shown the two campaigns converge. I can't remember if the launch trailer that was released about two days before episode one showed the one with the tyrant in, I'm thinking, that trailer. Does that show like Claire and Barry together or Moira and Barry? I don't think so, no. Mm. So, I mean, it, they could be two completely separate campaigns, I guess. But the only thing I really don't like about this, this the whole six-month thing is uh, what are other characters doing during this time? You know, we've shown that Chris will go to hell and back for his family members and his friends, so he must surely be out looking for Claire during those six months. And then you, you know, it leads you to believe: why doesn't Barry bring a, a fucking battalion to this island? Why is it mm-hmm. just him? He mentions in dialogue, doesn't he, that he's been briefed about what to expect on the island. So why the hell does he come on his own? Is it confirmed anywhere apart from his bonus unlockable costume or whatever that he is actually BSAA now? Yeah, we see his ID badge at the start during the intro. No, oh, right. He's a combat specialist probably a consultancy role that's that's really good then so it, you'd like to think with all those resources he would be able to bring a unit with him or something like that but yeah he comes I mean, on his own point of having units that they have yeah <laughs> it is a bit weird <laughs> i do agree uh, unless it just becomes like unless the files allude to the fact that it becomes a lost cause and barry decides to go on his own because enough time has passed and they're declared dead or whatever and he doesn't believe it but that leads me on to another problem and this is a problem with the episodic nature of it, is the fact that we've already had trailers... Well, I don't know, I suppose, because the reason why I asked if the com- campaigns converge, the Moira being dead reveal by Natalia at the end of Barry's chapter, it's so obvious she isn't. But yeah, they, they pull that card really early. You know, if it had been like episode three with one sort of episode left to go and they pull this out, then you might believe it might be a really tragic event but it's too early to pull things like that but then if barry doesn't find them then i don't know it's it's interesting i hope they know what they're doing and it's not just a gimmick yeah like the reason for leaving a cliffhanger in at the end yeah it's not actually that important you'd hope that because they mentioned it it's an important thing like the six month thing is more important than the seemingly fake not true death thing probably is so based on the sort of hour hour and a half we've got so far where do we think it's all going to lead to? I mean, what kind of things do we want to see next? I, I don't. I just. I, I don't know. I was gonna say I'm more outdoor environments, more more tension, less cheesy dialogue. <laughs> but that's probably not gonna happen. I mean, the teaser we get for the second episode suggests that we're gonna meet some more NPCs, the other TerraSave members, mm-hmm. and that Barry and Natalia are gonna head to the what does she call it? The the Vosok or something? That big weird castle thing. Vos, Vostokol or whatever. 
best what's up what's up so hopefully things are going to open up and we'll hopefully learn a lot more very soon I was going to say with with that with that name and a lot of the the files that are there so far is, obviously implies uh, some sort of Russian connection. That's about it. I'd, I'd be interested to know if that's got any relevance to the story. Final conclusions on episode one, then? It's been better than expected. Not quite the homecoming. I think Capcom would have us believe it is. But, yeah, promising start. We could have maybe had a little bit more story to keep us going because we've mm. had painfully little at the minute. If it wasn't for the Ouroboros name drop at the end of Barry's campaign, I think we'd all be sat here thinking, we've got like 90 minutes of play time here. What the fuck was the point, really? Uh, and I, especially for someone, like if for us it's fine, because as I said before, we've we've got you know, interest in the background and the history of the franchise. But if this is supposed to bring in people who either don't really play these games very often or at all, there's no real nuggets to drag them in. Like the cliffhanger at the end is probably not going to mean a lot to them on face value. And the rest of the story is pretty much in the dark, so there's nothing grabbing attention other than potentially the question to know what's happening next. George, what do you want from episode two? Well, m- more of the same. I hope sort of the aspects that I enjoyed about it, that, that a lot of these aspects relate back to the older games that, that they've implemented, that they continue with, that they work well. So more from the files, you know, the continuing atmosphere. Hopefully it doesn't feel as linear as Revelations 1. I was particularly pleased how unlinear the prison section felt. And yeah, a development of this mystery lady, you know, without any of the mistakes that we've had with enemies in Resident Evil 6. So I'm, I'm hoping that this, that, that this enemy will have some sort of legacy, but, you know, only time will tell. Just patiently waiting for the next episode. At least it's not far. At time of recording, it's four days away. So. Next time on Revelations 2. Moira was trying to get to that tower when I was with her. I need you to take me there. Can you do that? But if we've been infected with something... I promise I'll catch up! Is this the place? The passage? Don't be scared. So you finally came. I'm... We are on this motherfucking island! <laughs> so... We're recording this for episode 2 on Monday the 9th of March, so it's before episode 3 is available. What's what's your brief thoughts on how episode 2 played out? I I thought it was a great improvement. I mean, I think that's what the general consensus has been anyway, but it was a really great improvement on the first episode. It expanded everything that was good about the first episode and then added much more to it. Um, as far as the episodic nature goes, it's kind of one of those hard things because I think I said this last time, but I kind of feel like the first episode really needed to kind of sell itself to people who haven't played it before. And I kind of feel like the second episode had so much content that probably would have won a lot of people over that wasn't available in the first. But then you kind of got to wonder how they would have started the story, where it is with it. So it's it's kind of interesting. I like the fact that the plot's picking up, which is good. There's a lot of... um. I mean, there's still things to be, uh, obviously stuff to be answered, but it, it's all starting to fall into place, which is really, really good. And the gameplay was definitely much more down that, that run of actual survival horror than just action. Not to say there wasn't action, obviously, but it, it started to feel like a bit of balance. I thought, um, and again, I'll just remind everyone how venomous I was about the game before it came out. I think after playing episode two, it's my favourite slice of Resident Evil since Lost in Nightmares. I genuinely was blown away by how atmospheric episode 2 was, how much of a step up in improvement and production value it was since episode 1. The locations, the fishing village, the the walk through the deserted town in the rain, like the series has seldom been more atmospheric in the last few years and the way the story is ramping up, there's a couple of good files, the big reveal at the end. I just condemn the fan base and Capcom for spoiling it early because to have seen that explode on the internet would have been really, really special. But if episodes three and four build on this chapter the same way it built on episode one, then it, we could be in for a really special title. And it came really out of nowhere. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we start in, with Claire in the in the fishing village where you have to get the parts for the helicopter and I sort of miss them sort of fetch quests where you've got to get multiple items for things even though the area itself was quite small it reminded me a little bit of where you have to get the parts to get the trolley working in Resident Evil 3 
but in terms of location, it was uh, it was a nice little area, and obviously we got to meet the TerraSave NPCs. What did you think of the the characters? I didn't hate them. I thought I thought I mean again the writing and the the sort of overblown dialogue lets it down a little bit. Um, mm. But the, the 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 characters themselves were okay. Uh, Neil Fisher, I think you've said this, John, in the in the forum. He may as well be wearing a a t-shirt or a sign above his head saying, uh, you know, game villain. Yeah. But the characters themselves were likable, and and you know, and that they've sort of Capcom have done half the battle there. If they're likable, then you kind of care about them a little bit. The only thing I would say is that who's the Spanish chap, Pedro. He just saw it coming a mile off. I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. Although I did like his little reference with the, uh, <laughs> I'll be examining this. I thought that was really funny. That. I don't know why it just tickled me that one. I think it was bit, it was well placed. It was it didn't feel overly forced. Yeah. Um, I was going to say that the, the dialogue is still pretty atrocious. I think the first line of dialogue in the episode is in that cut scene is one of the one of those guys, and it's it's a terrible line. I can't even remember what it is. It's something. Um, like, my life is balls. My life is balls. <laughs> it's like really, this is your opening bit of dialogue. Great. But going back to the fishing village, yeah, what what a location. I mean, I couldn't believe how many little nooks and crannies there were to explore. Mm. You know, and there was even, like, the occasional optional building. You know, you could actually miss certain items and the occasional file. That, you know, it was brilliant. Really, really... And it was eerie, you know. It was not quite midnight, not quite dark. It was sort of dusky dark. The wind was blowing, the, the atmosphere, sounds and everything. And the fact that it's not flooded with enemies made it really good. Like, you would run around and there'd be an enemy in an alcove and they'd jump out. And it was actually, like, you know, a little bit, not massively. It's not a scary game, but it, it occasionally just a little bit unnerving. Yeah. Not bad, Capricorn. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say the same thing about it's not just the alcoves, but sometimes enemies would be on roofs and they'd jump down onto the ground in front of you and you wouldn't know. You could hear noise and you knew they were somewhere and then all of a sudden they would leap down in front of you or behind you sometimes as well. Um, and, and you'd be like, oh, hold the crap, where'd you come from? Like, it, yeah, there's a little bit of tension in, in that. And obviously the Overseer sort of came into play a lot earlier this time and we learned a bit more about the bracelets. Pedro seemed to get really frightened when they were locked in the bar and that obviously triggered his mutation. What do you think of this this sort of mechanic where fear triggers this new virus? Welcome to the brink of true fear. The Overseer. What do you want? I need to throw you at the wall and see who sticks and who doesn't. The wall, in this case, is a special virus that I injected into each of you. A what? You what? We will all die. There's no question of that. But one of you still has a chance of dying well. The only thing is, I can I can see it's just not going. It's not dynamic, is it? It'll be scripted. So. Mm. It, it, you know, the kind of fear mutations will be at the storyteller's discretion as opposed to a genuine gameplay mechanic. Like, it would have been nice if there'd been an outcome where if you'd actually fought back the bar, Pedro didn't turn. Because yeah. you actually stop him from reaching that point of fear. But I think it's just, it, it, it's, a, it's a story gimmick. I don't think it'll affect the gameplay in any way, which is a shame because they might have been onto something really special with that. I mean, I've not done it myself, but I take it it's possible to kill Pedro as Claire, which would obviously change the outcome in Barry's scenario. It does. Yeah. It allows, it, it, what it does is, it's a throwaway thing, really, but you, you, if you kill him, um, you, not only do you get a trophy, but Barry can pick up the drill early in his campaign and then use it to un- open a door where he can get the last bug, insect larva, for the secret file. But, and, and obviously his ending is very anticlimactic. He just he, he arrives at the building and that's it. You, you actually arrive at that building and then upstairs like there's the area where he would normally burst out of. You can't get into it and you kind of like at first you're like, what is this? Like if you don't know, because I killed, killed him obviously without knowing this. It's like, is there supposed to be something happening here? I pushed the helicopter out of the way and then nothing happened. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm guessing this was something different if I'd made a different decision okay yeah cool did you yeah, do that so first time then Rombie? yeah I did yeah because I, oh, right. like, oh, cool. I, I just like started shooting I had so much I had so much ammo left over from episode one because I'd gone back and replayed it obviously and the second time around I'd been quite you know sparingly on my ammunition and, and healing items so I had quite a bit and I was like man I might as well kill him because it's 
you know i've got ammo to spare and there's plenty around the area as well so yeah and then from the fishing village we sort of moved on to the the town area um looked very much like chernobyl for me you know sort of abandoned all it all it was missing really was that ferris wheel in the dead aim podcast you 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 know said it would have been nice if we got a chance to explore the island and i and i feel they answered that in a, in a single chapter you mm-hmm. know for the first time we actually are getting to experience an area or a, you know a populated area past all the carnage and i don't think that's happened in the series yet i can't you know, usually the outcome is an area gets destroyed. This is one that's just sort of been left to decay, and mm. it, I think that's what adds to the eeriness of it. You know, you sort of even even as Claire, you kind of miss the party a little bit. It feels well designed and well formed, like as well, which helps. Like that's the other thing about it. It doesn't feel. I think it's going back to that thing when I was talking about with the first two revelations, and it's like you're on a ship with a lot of corridors, and it's all very samey, same. At least this has been a bit of variety. I mean, people can say the graphics are not the best ever, but at least there's a variety of locations that it starts. To, especially, I think that's a big change for the second one. It's like so much of that first episode is in the prisons. The prison's quite bland mm. to a certain extent, and then this is quite varied. There's the outdoor locations, the fishing villages, underground, there's in buildings. That, you know. It's quite it's quite a lot of difference in such a small space of time. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think what new enemies were there in Claire's campaign. The dogs were they in Claire's campaign? Yeah, just a little bit when you're trying to get into the the bar, and then there's just the the enemy at the end. Oh yeah, the but what was that? <laughs> I have no idea. I think the bosses are the only thing that let it down really, because. Pedro is just a chainsaw guy wannabe again. You know, they couldn't, mm. Capcom couldn't resist the temptation to put somebody in there with a piece of, you know, automated well, machine. Well, yeah, it's like, it's like, it's, it's, don't worry, it's not a chainsaw. It's a rock drill. Yeah. It's like a chainsaw, <laughs> but not a chainsaw. As for that, I've no idea. I mean, what is even, it's like a, like a cannon, but. It's, it's really like, I was thinking about it because I was talking to someone else about it. It's like, the the idea almost feels like with with the shelves and this fire can it's a bit like the fight in the last of us in the school gymnasium where there's the bloated enemy and he fires big spores at you yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that but with fireballs and it's like they're pretty much just like said that's a really cool fight let's just copy it and figure out a way to kind of try and make it similar uh, the enemies wise that's it and then Claire once you've had that battle Claire scenario ends with a sort of mini cliffhanger in itself doesn't it Talia gets snatched yes though you find obviously you find out what that is more or less straight away in the second half yeah yeah so Barry then um, Barry sort of starts at the back at the radio tower I presume it's like early morning because like the island's sort of shrouded in mist and we get quite a nice sequence where you're sort of moving through the forest and you come across all these sort of abandoned, dilapidated wooden buildings. I mean, we talked in the last episode about how we like the revenants, but I think they lose something when you're taking them on in the middle of the day. And I think the stealth mechanic robs them a little bit of their fear. Yeah. Because mm. that even if they even if they do see you, even on a harder difficulty, they're pretty easy to kill. Mm. If if they turn them into like you know take uh, alien isolation, if they were like one hit kill enemies then I think they would have a massive sort of fear thing attached to them. But, you know, you, you sort of become... Like, the stealth mechanic's interesting, but it's not game over if they see you by any stretch. Mm. Well, it's, it's also to do with the numbers, I think, because they start to be thinned out quite a bit there. There's, like, one or two in a particular area, whereas it's, as it ramped up in the end of episode one, they started becoming, like, three, four... And to, you know, to the point where Barry's like escaping or rather than fighting them when, they, when you first knock down that gate. So I think maybe that's also it as well. They're just kind of, that's gone back to kind of very basic numbers because it's early on in his chapter and that stealth mechanic kind of becomes so strong. Mm-hmm. And obviously when we get to the fishing village as Barry, you're introduced to another new enemy with the, the glasp, which I thought was pretty cool because it, it adds an element of panic when Natalia starts screaming that it's getting closer and, you know, you think you've got it in your sights and you, you miss it, you know. I thought the glasp was, even though it was quite easy to kill, it was quite a quite a good enemy. Yeah, I, th- I thought it was a masterful use of the co-op, actually. Mm. You know, the co-op aspect. I, I, just brilliant, brilliant mechanic. And again, yeah, like you say, they're easy. They don't possess that much of danger. But as a, as a mechanic, 
in like a horror game, it's actually pretty good. They can be dangerous in an enclosed space, which is what I found. The one time I actually got killed by one was because I didn't realise that one pretty much snuck up behind me and it was an enclosed space. Do they kill one, one hit? Yeah, they're one one hit kill. Oh wow. They they, they uh, p- pretty much pick Barry up off the ground and then drop him and then drop a whole bunch of bugs or larvae all over him. It's kind of weird. Hmm. It's worth having worth having a look if you haven't seen it. But yeah. Uh, you, you get the indication that they're close by because as that kind of haze becomes really, really intense and like it's almost like there's a noise that's associated with it. It's almost like a headache-inducing noise and the screen gets really distorted and so you know that you're really close. And I had shot one and I knew there was another one somewhere in the room I was in, except I wasn't quite in the room. I was like on the edge of a corridor and it was behind me in the corridor. <laughs> so I had no idea where it was, obviously. So yeah, they. I mean, if you had a lot of them in a small, in small, small spaces, it would be horrific. <laughs> hmm. um, and then we obviously got the town as Barry, and it's raining, which, as you said, Sean, is is nice and atmospheric. Um, and I'm starting to really like the relationship that's developing between Natalia and Barry. And I think it's really refreshing that we've we've got someone caught up in Terra Grigia rather than Raccoon City again. They're just dropping in the references, aren't they? In mm. this one. It's mm. like a, it's like a, a fan of the series to have this many references in a single place. It's how much further is it going to go? Because I know Nick's bemoaned on previous podcasts, hasn't he? That it's always Raccoon City, you know, when Terra Grigia was every bit as big. Mm. But yeah, it was a nice reference, and obviously you get the Damnation reference as well on the radio transmission, which seems to confirm that Claire's campaign takes place before Damnation, and Barry's obviously takes place after, which I think is a nice. A nice little way to split everything up. Yeah, I mean, in, uh, Barry's scenario on a whole is it's probably a lot more in line with the series' history. You know, it's a lot slower. In fact, the whole episode, really, even Claire's was a lot slower, wasn't it? There wasn't many bottleneck points, like we said the first episode had. Mm. Yeah, I kind of almost feel like this second episode is a better showcase for what this game probably is going, hopefully going to be overall than the first episode was, which if you're going to make the first episode, the first episode probably should have been more what the second episode was. It's kind of a weird way to say it, but it's, you know what I mean? Like, if they're wanting to bring people into this, then if this is how it's going to be, which seems better suited, I mean, who knows? I mean, the third episode might change it up again and it becomes like just a full-on action fest for the third episode and then, I mean, we'll, we'll find out, I guess. What do you guys think of, like, the overall sort of length because we're about halfway through now, the sort of overall length and difficulty of the game. Because I must, I must admit, the chapters are a lot shorter than what I expected. Yeah, I think once you know what to do, you sort of get through them in sort of 20 minutes, don't you? Hmm. Well, I mean, that's the whole idea of that the countdown mode, obviously, is to get through them as fast as possible. If you go and play that mode, like it's obviously built around the idea that if you need to, you can speed through it. I mean, most people sat came out this the other side of the second episode, and this is myself included, finding that it was slightly longer than the first, which is a yeah. nice thing to have. Yeah. But I think overall, yeah, they are a little bit shorter than perhaps I was thinking. But I mean, I guess it's the balance for people who are buying. If you're buying the digital version and you're getting it episode by episode, it's for the amount you're paying for the number of hours. It's probably okay. Yeah, I'd say for a fiver each, it's pretty good. Mm. And what about the difficulty compared to past Resident Evil games? Because apart from the obvious lack of ammunition, it seems quite, you know, quite straightforward to play through. There isn't too many taxing moments. No, when, I haven't really died over much, even on the harder difficulties. When when I first played that first episode, it felt quite difficult at first. Because well, if you didn't understand the game, the, the way the game mechanics worked and the um, the general difficulty curve of just learning it was was it seemed all right. But then, as I said, I replayed it. I played it probably the way it's intended. It made it very easy, even on those harder difficulty levels. And that, that follow through as well with the number of points and the perk system to kind of upgrade the characters just makes it even easier. And so that, I think yeah, that, that's probably even its bigger flaw potentially. Hmm. Whisker. She's so scary. I can't stand her. Who? The woman here with Wesker? That is Wesker. Alex Wesker. Two Weskers? You gotta be shitting me. (laughs) 
So you finally came. Moving on to sort of plot, what did you think of the final cutscene then, Alex Wesker's reveal? I mean, what would your reaction have been if you, for example, you didn't know that it was a returning villain and you didn't know who it was, obviously? Well, just just rewinding just a little bit. Obviously, Barry's scenario ends in the beginning of the tower and that whole build-up, that area with the, the dolls and the wall scrolls and everything is just amazing. Mm. You know, it, 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 there's atmosphere. The music is just so creepy and everything about that area is... It, it's like the series has remembered it's a horror. You know, it started off as a, a survival horror series and it's finally found a way to bring a bit of that horror back. So straight away, you, you're unsettled. Then you pick up the first file and you get the T... Phobos, is it? T- oh, yeah, I don't know if I T- like T- that. Phobos, and you're not really able to piece that much together with that. Mm. There's a slight connection, I suppose. You know the Ouroboros mentioned from the previous episode when Barry mentions it. And then you go up the stairs, and then you find a file which says... Oh, what is it called? Is it a letter to my dying father or something? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and then straight away, if we'd not known that, uh, who the villain was the reaction to that I'd have probably dropped the controller <laughs> because you know you straight away it's all coming in you know all coming together and you think fucking hell this, this is got to be Alex it surely has to be because that's the letter to Spencer you know it talks about how your son has just you know killed you or whatever and then straight away they give you the reveal amazing mm. and it's the only thing I'm disappointed with is I just I, I don't see her surviving this game as like a mutant we don't think that's her do we that thing that turns up at the end. Um, I think it is, yeah, isn't it? Don't you? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know any spoilers in regards to Alex Wesker or what happens to her, but I can't. Even Capcom wouldn't kill her off in the game she's introduced in, surely. Mm. And, that, and to have to have her already mutated before we've even met her properly. Well, because I think you'll meet the human version of her in Claire's campaign. Cause her yeah, thing I'm, with, is, I'm with that as well. Yeah. The, the muffled voice that you get thought sort of through the mask does sound like the same actress yeah, yeah. and this and the style that they've chosen to portray like being watched is in that same style as the overseer in claire's campaign through the cameras there's a couple of times in barry's campaign where you hear that voice and it's still kind of looking from afar yeah i feel the same way and the fact that it's the reveal with the picture that you know mm-hmm. it, she's named and then she appears and yeah it's it's interesting too because I was thinking about you were talking about the the uh, the design of the area and stuff. The the I th- I don't the dolls are kind of interesting. There's obviously going to be something to it, but it kind of also also in a way harks back to Code Veronica because as they they are in the in the manner with the dolls hanging all over the place is kind of creepy and weird. And it yes. I, I, I I kind of wanted to know if that was almost a way to kind of throw back to that as well. But it threw uh, interestingly there obviously there are people out there that have have no idea. They don't have much idea of the deeper part of the canon or history or anything about the Whisker children. And so they they see this area and they they hear the name Alex and they're like, is it Alexia? And I've seen a few people get confused about it and have mm. to go talk about it and discuss it. So in some ways, the whole idea of what Capcom was wanting to do is working. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got, definitely got a lot more to talk about this time. I mean, the files, I thought, were a lot better this time around. The people who, who were living on the island seemed to view Alex as some kind of saviour and the file where the guy on the helicopter comes to the island was quite good how he's just sort of landed and they've seized him and kept him hostage for some reason I'm looking forward to seeing how all this is playing out I'm assuming Alex has eventually used everyone on the island as test subjects but we'll see Well, that, that was what I was going to say to you because I think you mentioned it last last time we recorded but um, the, the secret files which you've, you'd obviously unlocked and I think Sean's now gone off and done the same thing because he was talking about the larvae before but I, I think blatantly if you unlock those first couple of files after the first episode there's already blatant spoiler hints towards who's involved and why and we talked about the whole why is clear on the island kind of thing and it obviously just comes down to test subjects again mm. <laughs> which I'm not entirely sure if if, if that's 
it's like it, it does seem like a bit of a missed opportunity like there must be more to it than this fear thing and just going oh there's there might be some people because they've they've all uh, most of them have survived various events i think that's the only real reason why they've been picked well i wondered that because this fear thing obviously comes into it and must, she must obviously be looking for people who aren't easily frightened Obviously, we talked about Pedro mutating really quickly because he, he shat his pants, but, you know, you've got someone like Claire who's been on Rockfort Island, she's been in the, the Harvardville Airport incident, and you've got Natalia who's been in Terra Grigia, and I think the others have mentioned they were in Kijuju. So I'm wondering if that's why they've been picked, because they've sort of already been exposed to bioterrorism and they might not easily be frightened. There's obviously this connection to, to, to the list and uh, and the the uh, the obviousness of the bad guy in, yeah. in amongst the group that you know we everyone picked a mile away and uh, only got more obvious as that you read those files so because his bracelet's green isn't it all the way through yeah yeah, yeah. And that's and that's another dead giveaway isn't it and he's very confident about being able to split up and you know I'll find you again later it's like well, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> You must have liked the the Spencer letter. Yeah, nice. yeah, it was good. I'm I'm hoping there'll be a lot more of that because I mentioned on Biohairs. I hope they don't cock up the whole Wesker children thing by making too many plot holes. I mean, that picture of Wesker and Alex was nice and all, but surely it all. I mean, it all depends when it was taken, obviously, but. Surely they'd be wondering why the other one was called Wesker as well. Oh, I said this to someone else. I think it's not even just the idea that there's these two quite high-level researchers in the company called Wesker, but that there was... How many children were there? 12, 13? Yeah, 13, I think. Plus the fact there was an original Wesker who they're all named after. So there's 14 Weskers in this company. This didn't raise any eyebrows with anyone else at the company at any stage. Like... <laughs> But this is what I mean, though. I mean, I hope Capcom have thought about these things rather than thinking, oh, yeah, let's just have a picture of Albert and Alex together because it'll look cool and people will love it. And it, it makes an easy title to, to Albert Whiskey, yes. The other issues is, I mean, there are some people being kind of a little bit picking at this whole six-month thing, which I can kind of understand, like, okay, yeah, so Barry's obviously being told some information because there's some information about an overseer and, like, stuff he's been told before he's come on this mission. And there's this whole six month thing, but nobody went looking for Claire in six months. Nobody um, realized that these people got kidnapped at this, you know, terror save event, and they've all been missing for several months. Like it seems, mm. there's a little bit of this outside thought, which is like, how does this work? Like I can understand that Barry doesn't talk to his daughter very much because they've she's kind of shunned him away, and that comes through a, a, in the dialogue in, in the second episode, which is good. But that also doesn't explain why he wouldn't have potentially heard from Claire in six months saying, oh, you, your daughter's been doing this, this, and this at TerraSave, like, if nothing had happened. So it, it's kind of interesting that no questions have been seemingly asked by anyone and to why all these people have managed to disappear for six months. Mm. Yeah, a lot of people have mentioned that because, yeah, there has to be... They have to come up with a very, very good reason why the likes of Chris wouldn't be wouldn't be coming. I mean, yeah, Co- Co- Veronica proves that many... He went looking for Claire when she was missing within days, mm. basically. As soon as she, he, especially once he got a hint from the fact that she contacted Leon and Leon somehow forwarded the information on. But it's like he went looking, and I think he would do that. I mean, the only thing is if it ties into sick somehow, and he's you know just as the drunken wreck. The timeline can't work with that though, can it? Mm. Exactly, which is which is unfortunate. It would have it would have worked perfectly had it been placed together at that same point point time where he'd kind of gone off the map as well, but it doesn't. So. I mean, I think he will turn up. I mean, my money is that Chris and Jill will turn up in the helicopter at the end to rescue them, but it still doesn't really explain, you know, because like you just mentioned, Barry knows about the overseer and he knows about the experiments on the island. So why hasn't like a whole army of BSAA agents turned up? I, th- I should say it'll be. I mean, they they do have the the Biohazard Five writer, don't they? Involved in this, he's like an advisor, story mm. it. Um And so the Wesker children stuff, he invented it, probably in good hands. All they need is just sort of a throwaway thing that like the BSAA are planning to make a move, but Barry wouldn't wait, so he went ahead on his own. You know, they finally have locked down where it is and. Yeah, and they've done their research, and this is what they found out, which is what information he did have managed to glean, like the overseer and stuff. But then, yeah, got all hot headed and decided to charge on him because he couldn't wait any longer. He wanted to know what happened to his daughter. It makes sense. That would make sense. It was just 
it needs to be put in there. And then obviously it can lead to a really chaotic episode 4 ending and then they're saved in the last minute by the BSAA turning up in full force on the shore, like yeah. the ending of Jurassic Park 3. <laughs> <laughs> Unless maybe Alex has purposely lured Barry to the island for some reason and said, "Look, if you tell anyone else, I'll I'll kill your daughter." There yeah. is there is a possibility that um the the radio transmission was was delayed somehow and was then sent out at her whim. Yeah. Hoping that she'd lure out the right people, and then there's a the whole thing, obviously, luring Natalia out, like as mentioned at the end. So, I, which is interesting. I don't quite know how that's explained either, but there's obviously going to be something to it. Hmm. Just, I think the secret files were a bit disappointing this time because they basically, aside from the the, the Kafka one, is is interesting, but ultimately gives you nothing. It could have just been a file in the game, and the 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 Burton files again, they're just the same files as Episode One secret files, just worded differently. Yeah. You know, I was, I was starting to think we might start getting hints of what the Burton tragedy is, but still, still oh. nothing. I was going to say that there was some wording in that in that second episode about certain elements towards that, and it doesn't sound like it's either. It doesn't sound like it's not a thing, but it also sounds like it's not as massive as people are thinking it's going to be. Yeah, because he mentions his other daughter, doesn't he? Yeah, it's like she is. It's, it's like something's happened, but it's not like she's been killed or anything like mm. that. Mm. Yeah, I got but that. I, I don't know what it is, but yeah. and there's obviously hints that there's obviously this the, the savior thing we talked about that there's a mine somewhere. So one of these episodes is going to be a big massive mine mm. again. Mm. There's a location. But yeah, I mean secret files. I mean obviously in Resident Evil Five they were brilliant. I mean some of them were like 35 pages long, and I feel like Capcom have been lazy here because yeah, it's nice fan service having an email from Barry to Chris or whatever. But you know, really we need files talking about more about the Wesker children and Alex Wesker's background. I mean, do you think Capcom are going to explain, you know, give her a biography and explain who she was and when she got chosen by Spencer or, or are they just going to leave it up to interpretation? I'd like to think that, because I think they're bringing her back to effectively write her out. You know, I think I think they're going to introduce and deal with her in the same game, just because it ties up a loose end. Mm. So I would like to think they would actually go into a lot of detail. The only thing is, it, it looks episode three from what we've seen of the preview just looks like a lot of crazy action again. It doesn't look mm. like you know, it looks like we're going to go to an abattoir or something. as Claire. It looks to be like a factory. If you you, yeah. can, you can see it in the background when you look out the the window with Barry where the crashed helicopter is, and from the teaser it looks that you know there's like spiked ceilings. So hopefully it's going to be a bit more puzzle orientated. But then we do get. The you know sort of Moira being surrounded by Ouroboros. Yeah. So we might we might well get huge story consequences in there. I'm not convinced there'll be a, a file system explaining a lot of this background only on the basis of what I was told and what we've discussed about kind of getting discussion going online. Mm. I kind of get the feeling that they, they'll put enough in there just to make it hint worthy and understand enough to get people to ask more questions, perhaps talking online. Yeah. And so there won't be this full explanation like there was with a lot of the background special files in, in 5. I will say, though, I think if the leak hadn't happened, I do actually, and I'm not usually like this, but I do quite like the episodic nature of it. I, I think it's interesting. The fact that it is only a week apart, you know, means that we can do something like this. The discussion's reasonably moderate on the on the forums, and, it, and it's quite good to think, you know, God, it's only a few days, and I get to play the next one. You know, it's it's actually not that bad. Have either of you been on the actual official Capcom forums? Because I don't go on there at all, and I I, I no. just wanted to know if what's been going on there because that'd be interesting. Maybe I, after I've finished talking to you, I'll go have a look, but. I'm reluctant to go anywhere other than Biohaze at the minute, just simply because we have quite a strict spoiler thread there. And yeah. knowing knowing how much is in the open, it's like, you know, I was struggling to find one of the Kafka drawings, so I looked it up online. You know, and even in, like, um, like YouTube comments, you know, like they've got, like, walkthrough videos which show you where they are. Even in the comments on YouTube, there's, like, big spoilers you've got to be careful of. mm you know, and I think some of it is because people just like spoiling it. Mm. You know, it's like, yo guys, mm. I know who the villain is. It's, you yeah. know, all that shit. The, the, the leaks really, really backfired in terms of the surprises. 
that's unfortunate. As we we discussed kind of what happened with with five as well to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah, because all that was leaked, wasn't it? Literally a few weeks before it came out. Crazy. And the only thing I will say to finish really is that I think Moira was vastly improved the moment she interacts with Natalia. Mm. I think. Yeah. The, the writing still there is a bit clumsy and juvenile, but she becomes a character I actually start to like now. Yeah. You, you get that, that idea that obviously she has a, a, a younger sister and she connects with her just in the same fashion. It's, it's really good. I, I did actually enjoy that as well. So we're about halfway through then. Have you got some more clues? Do you have any more theories on the on the plot? I have no idea where this is going to go. <laughs> Absolutely no clue. Because it doesn't seem to be a straightforward follow-on from Lost in Nightmares because there's been no mention of an immortality virus. We've got this T4 boss virus now, and we've got well, Uroboros as well. Uh, there, there, there's obviously in that the father file, um, there's obviously a hint to continuing and bettering a, a legacy. Mm. So it tells you that, and obviously we know what we know the background of what the island research probably originally started at. What Alex Wesker took away from Umbrella gives us a good starting point to guess. But yeah, beyond that, I, I, I'm in the same boat. I was like, I have no idea. But if Alex Wesker is that creature at the end, then it's safe to say that she never did create an immortality virus. Yeah, but that may not be through intent. I mean, we don't know what happened during the events of Claire's being there, basically. I assume, I'm assuming directly it much like Sean as well, that because we haven't seen that, but because there's a difference between her voice six months early and six months later, that something has happened and this is how she's continuing to exist, but it's not because of the virus, it's because of something that's gone horribly wrong. All right then, so final conclusions on episode two? Uh, improvement, uh, mostly across the board, pretty much, except for the dialogue, which has stayed pretty consistent, is not being that great. And um, yeah, no, other than that, yeah, a general improvement across the board, really. I'll just uh, yeah echo what I said in the beginning. I think the locations are brilliant, the atmosphere is the best in such a long time. It's it's unbelievable, and for something I had so so little care about, I, I'm absolutely blown away by how much I'm enjoying it. I really am. You know, I've, I haven't been this excited about a story in the series for forever. You know, it feels so long since I've actually had something that I'm actually like looking forward to with regards to the story aspect of it, because even in all the build-up for Resident Evil 6, I was thinking it was mostly nonsense. You know, with Jake and all that made it quite hard to really care about, and the Ada clone stuff put a bad taste in your mouth before you'd even had a chance to play the game. Whereas this is like is building on a, a very well-loved chapter of the series that was Lost in Nightmares. It's It feels like a sort of spiritual successor to 5, which is held in massively high regard for me, and I just, yeah, I'm really surprised by it. You know, well done. I will say, I think the low expectation everyone's had has, has helped the game. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> mm. it's, it's interesting, because everybody couldn't wait for Resident Evil 5. They thought it was going to be the best thing ever, and a lot of people are ultimately disappointed. And this seems to have had the reverse effect. Because I've seen people in on the likes of The Horror is Alive who've slated the recent games, yet they've been pleasantly surprised with, with Revelations 2, so it's, it's good to read. Next time on Revelations 2. Wait. This is Moira's. No. No sign of her. Ugh. Of course this factory had to be a fucked up factory. She's responsible for the experiment six months ago. No. It's got all our names on it. I'll crush you. Where did we go wrong? Where's Moira? <laughs> So um, we're now on to episode 3, again we're recording this uh, a few days before episode 4 comes out so we still don't know how all this is going to end. So briefly, what's, uh, we'll start with you Sean, what's your thoughts on how episode 3 played out? I just think it carried on the way it's been building to be honest, uh, I think Claire's chapter is really impressive in some ways. Puzzles, they actually had to think a little bit about, they weren't just fetching, you know, fetching a key to another, um, you know, and I'll be honest, my brain wasn't working for the, uh, the statue puzzle where you've got to let the, the ceiling come down enough to break the statue to get the key, so I was, I was actually like backtracking around the building and trying to find a, an alternate solution, in the end it, it did twig and... And then you go into another area, and it, and it's not too bad. It's a bit stealthy. And then you get to the graveyard area, which is, has a puzzle for the first time in, like, 
a long time. It's a proper puzzle. And then it ends with a, a reasonably impressive boss fight, which I found quite challenging because I just had such a pitiful amount of ammo when I went in there for some reason. Barry's campaign, I think, is the weaker of the two this time around. It doesn't build the way Barry's has been doing in the previous two, although Alex Wesker is a really creepy monster. So uh, on the whole, I mean, we'll get into the story in a bit, but yeah, I think it's been building nicely. And again, if, if Chapter 4 continues to build, then I think we're in for a real, a really good finale. I think it'll be really special. Just to continue to say what a surprise this game has been. Would you say Episode 3 has been the strongest one so far, or do you prefer Episode 2? I don't, I don't think it built on the atmosphere as well. Um, I think episode two probably has the better atmosphere. But the locations were good, and Claire's campaign in particular, Claire's episode this time, was there was a little bit more options for exploration again. Like you know, I know it was contained to those buildings, and there's the there's the timed section where you've got to run through the burning building, which is a bit more of a modern Resident Evil trait, I suppose. But yeah, I had a lot of fun in Claire's. Barry's was all right, but the, the mine. The sort of quarry area didn't do a lot for me, and other than that, the the, the sewers and the you know having to throw the gates and everything like that, it, it was a bit slow. So I would say Barry's was not as good as we we expect with his, but on the whole, it, it, I would say I probably prefer two. But this was good. I think pretty much similar, but um, I mean I was starting to think of the atmosphere of that second episode was really really high, and there were elements of that still continuing on the third. But there's certain parts where it's just like oh, it's another lot of enclosed environments. So I think the lacking number of of new environments, I guess to a certain extent, probably takes that down a bit. But the, there are certain parts of it that are fine that you know or improve on that same idea I, the puzzles were probably the the standout same thoughts on that basically that it was it was pretty impressive to see some actual puzzles that needed thought and the one optional puzzle which was actually a full puzzle where you had to click on the right statues and work out which ones they were so some of them were obvious and a couple of them weren't so yeah i i, I thought pretty much the same thing barry's campaign probably yeah again was the weaker of the two but I did like the boss fight in the mines, so that was pretty good as well. Although everything seemed a little bit too telegraphed, so you start getting them to an area and it's like there's a whole bunch of ammo just kind of scattered all over the place. And it's like, well, clearly they're setting up something. The environment itself was fine. Like, it wasn't actually a very obvious large open space. It was just the fact that there was all this ammo scattered everywhere. But, yeah, pretty much otherwise the same sort of comments. Nothing else I can really add. I'd probably just echo your opinion there, really. I think Claire's campaign was definitely the strongest. But for me, the pleasant thing about the game so far is we're three quarters of the way through now, and it hasn't descended into sort of mindless set pieces and action all the way through. It's it's remained really grounded throughout. You know, Touchwood, we're, we're near the end now, and so far there's been no sign of any T-Rex tyrants, any parasite infected whales any robot salazars or chasing an Ada one clone in a in a mazda across the island um but yeah that's that's been the most impressive thing for me because it's it's you know previous resident evil games they've started off quite well like six started off quite strongly with leons and the first few chapters of the first revelations game are quite slow and atmospheric but it soon descended into the usual amount of set pieces and quick time events so i'm pleased this game hasn't followed suit and Capcom have definitely learned from Resident Evil 6 but yeah I mean I'll just echo what you two said I thought the factory and the slaughterhouse were very atmospheric puzzles again some of them the the laser one I thought was a bit shit because you're literally just following them footprints but the others were good and yeah like you said uh, Barry's campaign didn't really progress but we did get some nice character moments between him and Natalia yeah um I, th- I think the biggest mistake they did was having the grave stone puzzle optional it should have been required for progression I've not done that yet. What do you what do you get out of it? You just get a new weapon. Is it quite easy to solve? I did see the file that gives you it yeah, it tells it, you how to do it, but each stone you need to use has a clue attached to it and you just have to work it out from that. It, you know, it's a little bit like the puzzle in the very original where you've got to do the, you know, the paintings in order. It's a bit like that. I was going to say the same thing because and it lights up when when you click the right one, they light up, so mm. it gives you the indication that you've clicked on the right one. So if we start with Claire then, obviously we start off getting a note from Neil that tells us to go to the factory. And it was quite a nice touch with Moira basically saying, yeah, bollocks, it's a trap. But uh, yeah. obviously we're going we're to go anywhere. So what did you think of sort of, you know, the interior of the factory and the files we get in there, that sort of thing? I thought it was fine. I, I liked certain things. I mean, I liked the self-awareness of the um, Prometheus puzzle and, and the, the kind of ridiculousness of finding the uh, 
the liver and stuff. I mean, I, and I like the fact that that statue blew up at the end. I totally wasn't expecting that. But, I mean, yeah, it was a bit, it's kind of hard. The slaughterhouse itself was kind of cool, but the environments are quite samey in a certain sense. It's just like it's another quite bland factory otherwise. Mm. I'm, as, as everyone knows, I'm playing on the PC version, so... I had a couple of frame rate issues, and one of them was on that area where you have the machine, you have to like pull the lever and stop it to stop the hanging meat above the grinder to fill it up. And I actually had problems with, like trying to stop it accurately and trying to work out a space to actually stop it. I don't know how that is on a console anyway, but the frame oh, rate right. thing only made it worse. All, all um, I did was have Moira pull the lever and then switch to Claire and just shoot them as they hover past. Mm, that's what I did, yeah. That's a smarter way of doing it. I didn't even think of. Because <laughs> what what happened is you get so far through, and then the enemies come in, obviously. And I was just like, after that, I was just like, oh, I'll just start switching it and then change over. Like I was still changing over. I just wasn't doing it in one fluid motion. I would get more of pulling the thing, and then Claire was standing kind of slightly to the left, we were through the gap, and would shoot it. But yeah, that actually makes a lot more sense. Why didn't I do that? <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, now that we've spent a bit of time with the game, I'm actually finding the partner switching thing a lot better, because I know we moaned about it during the first episode, but I'm used to it now, and I think it's, you know, it's not as awkward as in the first game when you had to use the Genesis scanner. I was going to say, I think it's just because they've actually thought sensibly about how to make this work with the two characters mm-hmm. and how you combine the two. I mean, like the, the combat's geared towards it, the, and obviously these puzzles are kind of geared to it, even in ways that I obviously couldn't <laughs> didn't notice myself earlier. So. The only thing, I think that the problem was with the first episode, there was a couple of those, uh, we've talked about them, bottleneck areas with lots of enemies, and... You know, it was just, it just was unnecessarily frustrating in, at times. The character switching in the in the first couple of episodes because you're often in confined areas or areas with lots of enemies, and just having to like babysit an AI character through moments like that is just it's just painful. Mm. Like if you if you've played it on the harder difficulty, that you know flamethrower room in the first episode is just torture. Um, whereas the set pieces for the, the the following episodes have been much better in terms of how they integrate the, the switching. It's, it's not always perfect either because sometimes boss fights you'll have your AI partner character getting smacked around quite a bit and sometimes they don't. It's, it, it is like a weird inconsistency to it and you still feel like you're kind of babysitting them a bit. But it's kind of a little bit more understandable than in a bottlenecked room. Mm. And I'm glad you mentioned the Prometheus thing because that's where I experienced my first death. Because <laughs> when, you put the, when you put the second liver in, I thought it was a typical Resident Evil, oh, you can hear the boss rumbling that you're going to fight as soon as you walk through this door, and then the statue just blew up in my face. <laughs> <laughs> what did you make of the factory on fire and the, the old switching the valve handle thing? It's frustrating. It was, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's the sort of modern nonsensical running through areas with a big explosion behind you and they get out just in time. You know, it's a bit of a Resident Evil 6 moment, really. But I mean, you know... That... The thing about it for me is it's just, it is, it's just it's just filling space, essentially. It's just an extra set piece kind of moment in that modern mould. And um, yeah, it's quite funny too because the first time I played it through that section, I actually got out with like literally a second to spare. So them flying through the air afterwards, kind of jumping from the building, was kind of actually accurate. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I actually completely fluked the doors at the end. I was concentrating that much. I didn't realise that there were traps on them, and I just from pure luck just went through the right door, not real, <laughs> not realising you had to go around the back with uh, with Moira and find out which one was safe. I was going to say I'm a, bit, I'm a bit disappointed that that doesn't change each time you play it because it's always the one on the left. Oh, does it not change? No, it's such, so disappointing. Well, it's not changed for me yet. I don't know whether I've just been been purely lucky. Was it the one on the left for you two? Uh, I yeah. yeah, I think yeah. it may have For me, been. it was the one on the left, yeah. All right, I've isolated the best candidate. Good work. Now it's your turn to fulfill your end of. What did you. Well, you wanted an Uroboros sample, now you've got it. Lapdog. You don't know shit about me. I know you were Lansdale's puppet. When Velcro incited the Terragrigia panic seven years ago, the FBC was pulling the strings. The old man went down, but he was smart enough to pass the torch before he did. You played me. Because you're an idiot. You thought you could create a new terrorist threat to justify the FBC. A monster like you could never understand.
So if we, I mean, obviously the big plot point from Claire's point of view this time round was <laughs> Neil. Are you all right with this one? <laughs> oh God, I won't go into it too much. But what was nice though, I mean, everyone's been mourning about how obvious it was he was the villain, and I thought it was nice that they, instead of trying to expand on that, Moira was just all the way through saying, well, you know, his bracelet was on green. I don't trust him, which I thought was was nice, rather than them trying to drag out what was going to be a really obvious twist. But yeah, his motivation. What did you think about Neil Fisher's motive of wanting to bring back the FPC? I'm sick to oh. death of these, these people. I'm sick of this game. Is this series? The last few years, it's just been about people deliberately creating biohazards to prove a company's existence is necessary. It's just oh, you know, the moment they said Lansdale and the FPC, I was I actually just say aloud, no. Stay far away from this game revelations and your nonsensical bollocks storyline. Well, <laughs> thankfully, I think, I think. Alex Wesker felt the same and dispatched Neil immediately. <laughs> I think my opinion stems more from the idea that for people who probably haven't stayed relevant to the franchise are going to be confused by a lot of that stuff. Like, I think it's kind of a bit of a weird step, and it's kind of one of those things where we, we were talking about it a lot. They want people to talk online with other people that have a lot of knowledge about this sort of stuff, and I just, I just don't think that's going to happen because I don't think a lot of people are going to care. They'll be like, "What? What is this organization? What's this organization?" I don't, I don't think it really matters to a lot of people, and so it kind of becomes this kind of subplot, which. If, if it wasn't there, aside from a motivation to get the characters on the island, it probably wouldn't make any difference to the overall plot, mm. I think, which is unfortunate. But. but this just feels like it must be like the fourth or fifth game in a row where we've had a character who's had the exact same motivation of using a bioterrorism event for, for the greater good. I mean, I can sort of understand Neil Fisher being a Lansdale sympathiser because despite what he did in Revelations 1, he was doing just that. He was trying to show how dangerous bioweaponry was. He just went about it the wrong way. But in terms of this, I just think his motivation is ridiculous because you don't need the FBC anymore when you've got the BSAA. I mean, obviously it was different in 2004 because the BSAA were just, uh, you know, they were just observers. This is before they were reformed into like a military unit. Yeah, there is no, I mean... It's like, just I nonsensical. Was, you said in, a, in one of the posts on Biohaze, you know, if a, an attack was to happen anywhere in the world in 2011, it would just be the BSAA drafted in. No one's going to say... Hey, you know that company from a few years back? Let's bring them back. Yeah. Sort out this terror threat. And my other worry now is that is this the whole reason why Uroboros is in this game? Just just because Neil wanted a sample? I was really hoping they were going to expand on on Uroboros and Alex Wesker was going to somehow improve it, but I'm worried now that it's only in here because Neil Fisher wanted it. Mm. I, I think and also by extension, yeah, the company kind of wanted to bring it back, as we've discussed. Like for, for gameplay elements and so forth, but not for actually any plot purposes. So what did you think of his actual mutation then? Because I thought, quite sadly, he was a much better mutation and a much better boss fight than Wesker was in Resident Evil 5. Well, what are we assuming he's been injected with? Because he's definitely a tyrant. He has all the hallmarks of a tyrant. He has like the exposed organ. He's rather large, like a 103 variant. Very similar to the one in Damnation when it becomes a super tyrant sort of thing. Um, but he has Ouroboros properties. Well, I think she just shot him in the neck with... Uh, Ouroboros! Didn't she? But uh, obviously he's already been previously injected with this T4 boss virus as well. So unless we're getting any files in episode 4 that explains it further, I'm sure I think we'll just have to say that he's, he's like a partial adapter because he's just not turned into a mass of tentacles like everybody else did. But, yeah. he, but he didn't stay as... You know, he didn't regain his human appearance as much as Wesker did. So, <laughs> it's hard. I don't know, but that's that's been one of my problems with this game in general. Is it's the story seems quite straightforward, and yeah, we get some nice details in the files, but everything's you know everything's just very very vague. I've gone on about how they've got a Roboros, and Romby, you had a theory about Terra Save going to Kajuju and you know X Tricell researchers and things, but all we get in a file that I found anyway is oh the samples have arrived from Africa, and that that's it. Yeah, it's pretty vague. Yeah. I'm just hoping that they've... Because <clears throat> I share that sentiment. I, I do quite like the files and I like all the Easter eggs and references, but I do share that sentiment that they are vague. The only thing I, I would say is that there's a lot of video files still unlocked in the in the game, so hopefully the last chapter will be very big, very extensive and, and full of details. Mm. 
but the, for the actual boss fight itself, I thought it was, you know, it was quite good. Nice big open area, quite tactical. Did you think it was relatively easy to kill him? I, I had very little ammo, so I was struggling like hell. I had to get him to destroy the, you know, flammable canisters, and then try and lure him onto the flames, and then knife his exposed core. It was tricky. I didn't die, but I was very close at times, and I thought it was very much like an old style. It was like fighting tyrants again in Night 2. Mm. The end, you know, it was very tense and fast and not QTE nonsense. Yeah, I don't think we've had a single quick time event, have we, in this game so far? No, no, I can't think of one. The closest was they actually just at the end of it picking up the gun. Yes, the character switching option. Which I didn't do. Yeah. I just did it as Claire. Did you? So I think that, the so the, the, I've seen the more scene on the internet now, and it's brilliant. Mm. Mm. Do we think that's that's going to have any repercussions, depending on what character you pick? There's a rumour it does, isn't there? I don't know. I've not seen anything. Well, I've not seen anything either, but obviously, would it make a difference in terms of Moira you know, refusing to use firearms, that now that she's picked up a gun and used it, will that make a difference? Or... Like you say, if you just if you just carry on as Claire and Moira still refuses to use a gun, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not genuinely find that brilliant. I have no idea how it's all going to resolve itself. Hmm. All right then. So if we start talking about Barry, I mean, obviously his level this time around was quite bland. It, it sort of started and ended in the same place, really, didn't it? With you being confronted by Alex. But I thought we had a really nice character moment at the start, and I thought the voice acting was quite good, where Barry's giving her a piggyback ride, and he explains what happened. It was Alex Wesker. She's responsible for the experiment six months ago. They called her the Overseer. She took Moira away from me, and now I'll never get... And all for fucking what? I'm sorry. It's okay. She said she was going to be reborn. Reborn how? With a virus? Why did she need my little girl? Doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. I can't remember anything else. (sighs) Oh, sweetie, I'm sorry. It's my problem, not yours. Just take it easy. Barry, are you okay? Yeah, I'm... uh... I was just thinking about how I used to go for walks like this with Moira and Polly. Were you a good family? (laughs) We tried to be. Moira and I fought a lot. Even after she grew up. Was it because she used bad words? (laughs) No. She just did that to take me off. I'm the one who broke us apart. I messed up real bad as a father. She and Polly were playing in the house. I forgot to lock up my guns, and my rush. Polly had an accident. Was it Moira's fault? No, it was mine. But I raised my voice at her, and I guess I never really got around to taking the blame. Polly survived, thank God. But not me and Moira. We started drifting apart. I think she still loved you. I appreciate you saying that. I'll tell you this much. I couldn't save her, but I'm gonna save you. I promise I'll get you off this island. I know. Thanks, Barry. I really liked it. I I actually, I thought it was a great mixture of like being able to get some exposition out of the way that had been well overdue and also having a character moment at the actual event itself and putting it into a gameplay fashion where we see in an area that that didn't otherwise have a lot going on because that first section is quite quiet. So it was good. I thought it was a good choice and, yeah, really good. Were you satisfied with what the revelation was? Was it what you expected? As I think I mentioned last time, I, 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 I think we, we did talk about this, I, I said that the way he had kind of hinted to it, it sounded like it wasn't like a complete tragedy, but something had happened, but it wasn't like a death. It obviously wasn't in the end. So I, I think in that sense I was expecting what it was. Uh, I'm pleased it wasn't a death now. I know I know we've alluded that it could be, but I think it was... I, I always thought it was uh, Polly had accidentally killed herself, but I actually preferred this, I think. And it gives Moira a lot more depth, and I must say, as a character who we all despised quite a lot before the game released, Mo- I'm actually w- warm to Moira quite a lot now. Mm. I think they've built her quite well uh, in terms of a character over the episodes, and I think 
the bit with the gun and the you know the the, the family history from Barry. It, like you say, the fact that it's well acted, it's it's believable, and it, it kind of makes it just adds so much depth to a character who we've not seen for nearly twenty years, really. One of the person we should mention, he sort of turned up out the blue, was um, the old guy living in the sewers. Mm. What did you make of him? I think the payoff will come next ch- next episode. Surely got to because he's dead. Got, but there's, there was obviously something to do with the fact that when you're in Barry's campaign, he had the phone with that message. So somehow he has to yeah has to play back into it somewhere. And he has that quite nice file, doesn't he, about how he he uh, sort of documents how his daughter's grown up. Yeah, and you find one from find one from his daughter later on as well. Yes, you do. That's right. Yeah, so, I don't know, I mean, I wasn't expecting any other characters to turn up, but he sort of, he just sort of turned up out of the blue, and like you say, he'll probably come back in episode four. All right then, so Barry, we sort of go through the sewers, operating the sluice gates, it was sort of, sort of standard. Yeah. And then we get to the mines, which is sort of quite an open area, isn't it? We do have a another new enemy in that area with this Uroboros monster. I struggled with this guy, because I was very low on ammo. I actually just ran past him and didn't kill him. How did you guys get on with it? I did kill him in the end. I did try and do it the first time just by running the generator to the, the gate operation device. But yeah, I mean, he hits pretty hard. As soon as I've got a magnum, I tend to hoard all the bullets for big battles. And so I had quite a few. Um, so he, he fell quite quickly. But it was an interesting, interesting sort of design. He looked like he had a mass of faces. Hmm. When you say you, you ran past him, is that this? second time he appears or the first time I didn't actually know you could escape the first time because yeah, it think, smashes down the fence yeah you have to beat him back the first time but the second time I was just completely out of ammo I'd pumped everything I had into him and he still wasn't going down so I just ended up distracting him with Natalia while Barry moved the power thing into place to open the gate well, does Barry move it uh, on his own if he plays Natalia uh, no, but uh, yeah. I just kept switching in between, basically. I'm quite surprised you kind of ran out of ammo, because as I was saying kind of early on, that last area, when I first got up the top, I kind of was exploring before I kind of went too far in, and there was lots of hidden ammo and kind of a few crates and stuff around, and I was, that's what I was kind of saying earlier. Was, I felt that that whole, oh, he's going to come back and fight again, was quite telegraphed because of the amount of ammo in that area. And, of course, it's not just him, but obviously a, a couple of other enemies that turn up. And so I I managed to finish him off pretty pretty yeah. easily. It's probably just me being shit, in, in all honesty. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, and then obviously Alex turns up again. I mean, what, like you said, Sean, she does look quite creepy. And what do you th- what do we think? Has something gone wrong? I mean, what do we think's happening with, with Alex? I, th- I think the direction, you know, the, in terms of how she's presented in the videos with that very sort of strange editing and odd angles. I think it, it, it sells her really, really well. And she's definitely one of the creepiest monsters we've seen in a long time in the series. I don't know in terms of, I mean, if, if this bloody... It's implied so much that there's a body swap in that last scene. Mm. And it's actually Natalia screaming in, Al- in Alex's body. If that's the case, oh, God, I don't know how I'm going to feel about that. I know, it's, it's Paul Anderson territory. Someone said to me on Biohaze, how can I have issue with that and not have issues with things like the G-Virus? It's totally different. Some, yeah, someone mutating into a big monster that loses their all sense of self or anything like that is fine. But something that actually transfers one's mind to another, no, no, no virus could ever do that. And I know we're in sort of science fiction territory with the series anyway, and you can't apply realism to the series, but that's just, it's just too much. I, you know, the Ada clone was a stretch. Does it bother you, though, that obviously... We've been building up Alex Wesker ever since, well, ever since Resident Evil 5, really. And now that we've finally got her, I mean, I know we'll see we'll see a human form in Claire's campaign, but does it bother you that they've sort of mutated her so quickly and we're basically not going to get to know much about her? Yes and no. I think on the one hand, I'm pleased they're, they're going to give us resolution to a, a chapter of the series I never thought we would. On the second thought is, you know, we're going to lose another potential villain that could have lasted several games in one game but then on the other other hand i would like the series to forget the wesker name for a bit do you think it's a deliberate ploy on capcom's part that they don't want to saturate us with wesker but the, the thing well hang on we have got this plot point that we need to resolve i think one of the whole reasons this game exists is to, to sort this alex thing out once and for all and resolve it in this title and then move on i don't think she's going to be back after this which is you know sad i mean what do you think of a uh... I mean, 
the evidence we've got through the files, I mean, how did you envision Alex was going to be before we found out who she was? And I don't mean specifically a gender, but did you think she was going to, like, I'm quite surprised how much she talks about Albert and, you know, how she admired him. And I was sort of expecting her to be her own person and potentially to be not even called Wesker and just have a completely different name. Are you happy, basically, with how she's been portrayed by Capcom? To me, it makes sense on a narrative stunt. I mean, there's so much legacy essentially associated with not just the idea of what they've built around the Wesker children and stuff, but what people kind of expected, I guess, of Wesker and the relationship to Albert Wesker and all that sort of stuff. I I don't think they could escape not having these certain elements, especially when it has to tie into the story stuff to Spencer and stuff to do with the Wesker project. So kind of makes sense, I think. Like, I can't say I wasn't expecting that. And she's a researcher, and that sort of viral thing's all going to continue as well. So, I mean, there's, a, there's an already established history for the character before the character appears, so it can't not be true to that. It's a difficult, difficult answer, I think. But, I, I mean, it's for me, it's about what I expected, I guess. I think the problem is, uh, one of the problems you could say, is they've just taken the easy route with her, rather than making her own, her, like you say, her own person, and they've just basically had her become sort of Spencer Mark II. She's just following up that exact same plan. Hmm. You know, she, she's not really betrayed Spencer to do her own thing. She's just basically betrayed him so she can do it herself. The way it's implied in the game is, yeah, she's kind of halfway between Spencer and halfway between Albert Wesker, and, and, and so it's, it's, it's a bit of shared commonality between both of them but i mean i don't know how that is in the english i mean there's there's changes in the english language version people have already been pointing this out i'm sure there's some probably some changes that we're not aware of yeah that's that's one thing i meant to ask earlier actually sort of claire's relationship with neil fisher i mean a few people have pointed out that she she might have been romantically interested in him you know in the way she talked about him i mean that sort of came out of the blue did you have an opinion on that um, or do you just think it's purely an English localization thing that we're it, taking out of context? Even if it is, it doesn't bother me too much. You know, it's not implausible to believe she might have been romantically interested in him. It's not a problem. It doesn't change anything. And I quite like the fact that Mo- Moira sort of talks down to Claire a bit. Hmm. You know, like at one point Claire muses about like where Neil is, and Moira like quite rightly corrects her. You know, like you know, you should be more worried about where the girl is. Mm. That was one thing. I mean, thing probably bugged me more was the whole Claire Moira Natalia dynamic in the second episode was probably more troubling than the Claire Neil thing in the third, right? To me, because Claire's attitude was a lot different than perhaps she was with like Sherry in Resident Evil Two, and so yeah, I think that was slightly more off character than this. I think this whole thing in the third episode is. I think that is different in the Japanese version. She's a lot more uh, warmer. To Natalia. And again, so kind of maybe the same sort of translation issues and, and so forth. And But in that sense, I'd be interested to know, kind of, once this whole thing's over, what the Japanese take on Alex Wesker and it might be quite different in the end, who knows? I wouldn't expect any references to the immortality virus. I think that's done. Well, is this this body swapping thing? Must well, I suppose that could be a, a way of doing it, I suppose, yeah. Oh. There was kind of a slight, wasn't there a slight reference in the Spencer? file that she mentions to his plans but that not in a negative way or am i forgetting am i thinking this incorrectly that that file where she basically mocks him that when, we, when you first encounter him in the second episode uh i can't remember to be honest I need to reread it <laughs> yeah. but, but essentially hints to his uh not just like his foolish ideas but also the kind of thing he wanted but essentially also that she's going to take over that style of research or something to that effect i can't remember i really need to reread it one thing we have wondered throughout this podcast is um the whole sort of significance of the six month time difference and how barry's found the island have you guys watched the trailer capcom released for episode four yeah, the finale trailer, as it's called. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are, we, are you talking about the one in the game or the the one? No, the, the, one, the one Capcom released a few days afterwards with new footage. Uh, no, I I haven't seen that. Only the one that was on there. Right. It doesn't really give any spoilers, but it sort of drops hints as to what's it's going kind, on. Kind of like the the launch trailer was. It kind of drops some pretty heavy hints of things. Yeah. I mean, I, I won't go into it then if you've not seen it. No, no, no. Feel free to discuss it. It's not going to bother me. I mean, I'll, I'll go look at it afterwards if it's well, not a big deal. Well, bit, well it's, not, it's no surprise, but basically it implies that Claire has got off the island, but it hints that she's got off the island by herself and she's left Moira behind. And it sort of comes across in dialogue that Claire believes Moira is dead, which possibly 
explains why Barry sort of turns up six months later, you know, desperately just on his own, just refusing to believe, basically. Mm. Which I, I, I think is great. Yeah. You know, if Claire's gone back and sort of told people, look, there's no chance Moira's alive, everyone on the island died, it's just her, then there wouldn't be a big search. They wouldn't it would potentially waste resources. And Claire's word's probably good for a lot of people. Yeah. But then you, what you've got then is a, a character of, of Barry who just is just this desperate father who wants to try and redeem himself for his past mistakes and it's his way of doing it. And yeah, it's, it's kind of a nice little... I quite like it. Yeah, I mean, it answers the question well because, you know, Barry says in dialogue that he knows about the experiments and he knows about the overseer, so we were like, well, why aren't the BSEA here? But obviously it was Claire who told him about the overseer and she can't remember, well, she doesn't know where the island was, so it's obviously taken him time to find it. If she does get off and, and doesn't know where it is, that would explain as well why they haven't, like, airstriked it or anything. And one thing I picked up on when I, because I played through the game chronologically the other night i played all three of claire's chapters and then all three of barry's just for a different experience and if you notice when barry kills the first revenant in the log cabin oh, yeah. he says oh these creatures weren't mentioned on the brief and i've, I've noticed all the way through claire's campaign you don't fight a single Ouroboros creature apart from neil hmm. apart from neil obviously yeah like there's no revenants wandering around the island it's purely just the afflicted Mm. So it's something that was unleashed probably in the events after whatever happens in the fourth episode. Yeah, that's, that's what it looks like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems pretty obvious that Barry's mission is going to end up being successful. Are we all in this assumption that Moira is not actually dead? Yeah. I don't think she's dead, but I don't... I don't know. I don't know, I don't know how dark the game's prepared to go. Well, I'm not holding my breath, considering Capcom's track record for killing off its, its good characters. It's not great, is it? I just I can't see them. I mean, I can't personally. I mean, they, they they do love their happy endings, but I don't think she'll be right. Oh God, no! <laughs> I just had a thought. What? what if like the last shot of the fucking game is Moira on the boat, and then you get to see a close up of her eyes, and they turn red, and it's because Alex is still inside? Oh no, no! I've predicted the ending. Biohazard Gaiden all over again, <laughs> <laughs> isn't it? And Barry's involved again. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Oh, I've got to see that happening now. Oh, um, Alex lives on through the body of Moira. Oh, fucking hell, kill me. I, I, yeah, I'd be interested to see what sort of how it goes, but I'm I have no idea at the stage. Like I mean, I have thoughts on what I expect, but whether or not they're going to be anything close to it, no idea. Could go anywhere, really. But in terms of a, a standard Resident Evil game, then I mean, we we've just had the remake in in HD, which was on the whole glorious, and. <laughs> You know, Capcom have to be praised, I think. I mean, the series is nearly 20 years old, and yeah, it's, it's not as great as it once was, but it's still going strong. It's still very popular. As a basic Resident Evil game, what, I mean, what have you made of it so far? Stunning return to form for me. I'll be honest, I, I've had more fun with this than any game released since 5. But I what, really have. Why, I think why would you say that, though? I mean, what's what's impressed you about it? Because they've, they've remembered that, you know, character moments and storytelling is... And as much as we still say the files are a bit vague, I'll let episode 4 correct me on that one before I, I, I totally write it off with that. But, I mean, moments like we've discussed, like the Barry and Natalia moment, they've remembered that characters have fueled this series since the beginning. The reason why people have got so invested is because of, you know, the people who like Jill and Chris and Leon. And, and they've also remembered how to pace a game pretty well. Six, from the moment you, you start it up to the moment you finish it, it's just relentless with just stupid stupid over the top action and vehicle sections and this has entire moments where nothing happens you're just exploring you're taking in the setting mm -hmm. and then an enemy pops up and it's just one enemy and you dispatch it and then carry on it it's pacing's a lot more like the games of old i know it's a linear game in terms of there's not really any other way through the island other than the game is scripted but within those areas, there are like little rooms for exploration, there's side rooms, there's optional things to do. It feels a lot more Resident Evil than any of the games have for a long time. To me, this has done the job that the first Revelation should have done. It annoys me when people say, oh, you know, Re Revelations is the style of game we want, because it really wasn't for me. Whereas this one, yeah, it's, it's a lot better. It's still not perfect, but compared to something like 6, yeah. I'm mostly on the same page. I mean, I see it as a, as a good combination of various elements that they're trying to blend together very well. I mean, there's still action elements, there's still the occasional bottlenecks, 
but there's puzzles in the exploration. The pacing's definitely a lot better. The characterization's much better. Like there's the actual thought put into the history to an extent. Things might be a little bit overcomplicated, not by its own merits, but because of things that have been in the past, like what we've been talking about with too many traitors to organizations trying to inflict the idea of what why they need to exist and so forth. It's perhaps a little bit overdone, but you know, the rest of it's fine. The straightforward narrative outside of that has been completely perfect. I, I can't complain so far. Yeah, I mean, the, the boss fight with Claire uh, and, you know, Neil is a combination of old school kind of Resident Evil 2 tyrant battle with a little bit of Resident Evil 5 and 6 kind of thrown in there for, like, hit points and exploding barrels. But it's paced well and it, it's, you know, it's an exciting fight that actually, yeah, does have a little bit of, of, of everything in it. And I think, uh, you know, in general, yeah, they've, they've done very well to combine all the elements they can to make, make one game that's definitely probably one of the better ones in the last several years. I think as well, Capcom have also realised that fans love, like, connections to previous things. And this one has just spades of them you know we've there's a letter from peers as one of the secret files there's uh you know the references to the harvardville incident with claire jumping in to rescue uh ronnie uh, there's you know in-depth explanations about claire's relationship with sherry and that sherry's due to be released soon from her confinement you know and they finally realize that they've got such a rich open uh, you know, world to play with, and they're actually finally giving us the references that other games haven't done before. You know, Terra Grigia got a mention in episode two. It's all all connected really, really well. And again, I attribute most of this to the to the Resident Evil Five story writer or whatever who has been involved in this game on some sort of advisory role am i right in saying that yeah sort of special thanks i think is credit and he should have the keys to the series now because whenever he's involved the story seems to heal itself almost magically you know this guy just he does his homework and it shows because look at how poorly thrown together the story was in six You know, you want to read all the files, you've got to use the website, and it just was rubbish. How do you feel about the whole universe, if you like? I mean, if you go back five or six years, when, like, when you had your timeline out, for example, and everybody, you know, loved speculating on forums and theorising about particular plot points, I mean, do you think it has got to the point now where, unless you are, like, a a dedicated fan who follows the law, do you think it has got to the point where it's just far too complicated to keep track of now? I think at times it's, it, it, it gets a bit messy, and I think Revelations is the is the most guilty. The fact that you needed to spend a chunk of a podcast, if you remember, explaining how that story works for people, just shows you how messy that game was, uh, you know, with all the different factions and all that nonsense. But for a series that has had so many different writers and people involved and different directors, I think... It's a miracle the story actually does work as well as it does. There's very little problems within it, uh, which compared to something like Metal Gear Solid, which is pretty much from the brain and you know of one person, that has more continuity errors and problems than this series does. Hmm. And what about you, Rob? Because you wrote one of the first timelines, if not the first timeline. Do you think it's it's convoluted or Capcom releasing the games too quickly now? Do you think the story's basically just not as good as it was? Or do you think people are stopping to care because there's too much going on? I mean, you know, the time frame of this game, you've got the Svetlana Belakova in Damnation, you've got Derek Simmons, you've got Carla Radame, you've got the C-Virus, you've got a T4 boss virus. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, do you think that's part of the issue? I do, but I mean, my, my opinion might be completely different than other people's. The, the big change was the directionlessness to a certain extent after Resident Evil 4, because they had wiped away so much of the previous slate to a certain extent and then had to build new motivations and new changes and new viruses. And then when you start adding in the movies and each of the new spin off games, and you used to having to start creating new organizations and we've talked about this we've talked about the fact that it was a it's like a one-hit wonder organization the organization exists purely for a specific game or a specific movie or whatever it is and then it's got rid of but of course the problem is it still has collateral damage behind it like the events that happened in that have to spur on the next one and of course if it creates another organization or has another event then it yeah, it has to be kind of somehow slotted in. And, I, and yeah, they've done a good job to keep everything above board, but sometimes it does seem a little bit overly complicated. And so I can understand why some people might find, you know, certain parts of it very hard to understand or certain games certainly 
like Revelations quite overly complicated. But that said, Revelations 2 seems to have done a good job of trying to tie in as much as possible and add these references, but without making it overly complex. I think the closest thing it's come to is the whole thing with Neil's motivation and, and so forth. But that's, again, as I said, like kind of a cat carry on from the remnants of other games and other events. So, yeah, it's it's hard to, it's hard to say for a wide audience but for me personally yeah it's probably gotten a little bit too complicated and to the point where i've stopped caring about some of this outward stuff and kind of only taking things from the games on face value i think that's one of the reasons why we get a villain of the week for every game now yeah because i think it's because they don't in some ways they know that the audience that might play it and there will be some new people who, who play revelations but do you think that's part of the reason people are enjoying the story of Revelations 2? Because there are no new throwaway organisations. There isn't a, a villain of the week. You know, we've got this returning character in Alex Wesker. There is references to Spencer. Yeah, I think I think, I think that's why it's a winner with the fans, definitely. Uh, more than and, 6 was. I mean, 6, and, six could have built some good foundations. If, if Simmons had stayed alive, I've said this in podcasts before, you have a villain who can power on in the series that the character, the main, you know, the heroes would struggle to touch because he's so high up in the, in the US government. And that would have been a really good way to go forward. And they throw all that away at the moment he has a syringe in his neck. Into a giant T-Rex. Yeah. 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 So just to round up then, I know it's still quite difficult to answer, but where do you think the climax is going to go then? It's last episode's due out in f- uh, four days. So any thoughts on, on where you want it to go? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I want it to go or, or how I want it to end. Really, I'm, I'm leaving my mind wide open for it to surprise me. I will say the setting looks good. There's like some spooky-looking hallways with some paintings and whatnot on the wall. I presume, I assume that's the top of the tower. Well, it ends, doesn't it, with Claire going up to the top of the tower? Um, oh yeah, that's it. Yeah. And yeah. Barry is obviously still in the mine. Well, he got through off through off a cliff, didn't he? <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There must be like you the paintings of the wall. There obviously is a manor. There's a place where Alex Whisk is going to be living, and I I get the feeling there is going to be a lot of that usual kind of opulent decor. <laughs> I'm kind of wanting, but also kind of not wanting it to be another mansion. Yeah. <laughs> With the main hall. <laughs> With the main hall and everything. Yeah. But I kind of get the feeling it, it's kind of too obvious, but obvious enough that they would actually do that. And, and the little throwaway because. file with, a, a, you know, saying, I, I had this designed by George Trevor in the mid-70s. <laughs> <laughs> but when I saw that mansion, though, a part of me is sort of hoping that you'll find that big portrait of Alex and Albert Wesker there. And the is the revelation that they have met each other. I just think that would throw a complete curveball on things. You know, if Alex, once she found out that Albert had killed Spencer, that she did seek him out and they did, I don't know, well, I don't know what they'd do if they ever came face to face, but I just think it would be a nice twist on things if they did, because I think I said it in bio here, it's nothing to go on, but if you go by that picture, then Alex Wesker hasn't changed her outfit for at least 15 years. <laughs> Maybe she just likes white suits. I don't know. Mm. I think there'll be a lot of story in this one. And and like I say, I think there's... I mean, most of the previous episodes have had, like, a, a video at the beginning and a video at the end. This one, and then yet on the videos page in the, you know, in the extras section in the options, there's, like, something like 12 videos still left to watch. So it should be fairly heavy on story and cutscenes. Okay, then. So uh, we'll be back with the, with the last part next week, which we'll... Uh give us the climax of the game and hopefully we won't be sat here saying how it's all gone to hell because uh, it's, <laughs> it's been really good so far next time on revelations 2 my whole life has been a prelude to this my true birth wherever she went we could still catch her nice fucking emergency exit down below i think that's where we'll find her time to the cause of our misery Child. Run, 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 run! All that remains is one final test. Okay, so we're now recording this after episode 4 has been released. We've all played the game now, we've all finished it. So let's start with Claire's scenario. Um, Rob, what did you think of uh, Claire's episode 4? <laughs> Short. <laughs> pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Like, I mean, what else are you gonna say? I mean, it was nice to have all these files in a short space of time, but I really think they could have actually found a lot of more interesting ways to expand that out and make it a little bit longer, a little bit more interesting. I don't know if I should mention the whole collapsing roof 
thing at the end because I'm sure that's going to be a discussion in and of itself. I mean, it's it was interesting. It was fine. It was I want to say anticlimactic, but then it wasn't as well. I guess most of us saw where it was going. Yeah, I don't know much else to say about. It. <laughs> I thought it started off really, really well. I loved exploring like some of the the living quarters at the top of the tower, and we get a lot of files straight away. Which straight off the bat, I thought this is strange. You know, we get a lot of exposition very quickly here, and then we see Alex, and you just think there's going to be an awesome reveal, and bang, and then there's a self destruct sequence. But even with all that going off, I was shocked at how short it was. My first time through it, clocked at 15 minutes exactly, and it was just like wow. You know, where did that go? There's not really a lot more to say. It, it, it speaks for itself. The glasps don't really work without that mechanic of not being able to see them, so they just become frustrating now. And overall, it was a. For Claire's storyline, it was anticlimactic in one sense, but just, I suppose, a little bit disappointing. But then they do make up for it with an exceptionally long Barry chapter. So. I mean, what were you expecting? Claire's climax to be. I mean, what, we knew we were going up in that lift. We knew we were going to meet Alex. What did you think was going to happen? I thought there would probably be a big facility to explore because the tower from the ground looks absolutely ginormous and mm. there's a lot we've not seen. But yeah, I mean, I didn't expect Alex, the human Alex, to be removed from the storyline as quickly as it happened. I thought they might have even done like a proper full blown cutscene or something, but we don't even get that. It's funny too because everyone was having this thing on the internet about it. If it's going to be Alex, you know, like, are they going to get rid of it that quickly? <laughs> yes, it's going to be really quick. In a sense, like, that's kind of a good thing. Like, it's just like, well, totally wasn't expecting that to happen. But yeah, I agree though as well. I expected a lot more space. I mean, essentially, like, what you find in Barry's campaign underneath the ground is quite expansive. There's a lot of rooms. I kind of thought up in the tower there's going to be a lot of rooms, a lot of space, but it was very, very minimalist. There's not very much up there at all. Thinking about it now, was there really any point to the self-destruct? I Does mean, it just react to Alex's life signs then or something? Well, that's what it came across as. I yeah. Mean, I mean, all this hassle it's caused with Moira being crushed by all this rubble, but it doesn't really seem to have a purpose. It's still ultimately standing pretty well. Yeah, after it, was it, isn't it? Installed by the same company that did the one on Rockfall Island. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say, aside from the fact that I'm, I'm not even going to get into the crush debate, obviously, but more about the for the fact that obviously someone goes in and rescues her out of the debris, you know, tells you that obviously the place is still reasonably structurally sound. And it only makes the episode feel even shorter because you are hurried through as well. There's no time to take in the climb down or. I mean, I guess that's the other thing. It's, it's kind of false extinction because if there wasn't the race against the clock, you would. what are you going to do, make a leisurely pace down the... Yeah, yeah. What about the endings then? Because obviously there's two different outcomes. Do you not get the bracelet reacting if you've got the good? If you get the good ending, you don't see the scene with Moira's hand with the bracelet flashing. Oh, right. Okay. But I don't know if that makes any difference or not because there's definitely some kind of inconsistency with the bracelets because Pedro's flashes and then it goes to steady red and then he starts mutating. But with Gabe, his bracelet is red and then when the helicopter starts to malfunction it starts flashing and then he starts to mutate. So that's the only reason I'm not fully sold on this whole adapting to the virus thing. It might well be true, but I just think there's some inconsistency with the bracelets that we've not fully understood yet. But even if you do adapt to the virus, there's, you know, it's not going to stop you from being crushed by all that rubble. No, I'm sorry. Not, I'm sorry. Not, being, not for just a bandage being put around you. I'm not sure if I'm wrong about this, but I'm fairly certain I should have taken a screenshot of it. I'm fairly certain it looks like a big pool of blood under it. Yeah, it is. There is. Yeah. yeah. There is. Then again, how is there a big pool of blood in like? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, no. <laughs> and the only other thing that. I've got against the adaption to the virus thing is that there's a, there's a file somewhere I can't remember what it's called but it says something like that we've managed to reduce the immunity rate of the T virus to 2% so having Natalia and Moira being able to be both immune is you know what what are the odds going to be of that if there's only 2% you know 2% of people in the world that are going to be immune to this virus and you've got two of them on the same list of 10 people <laughs> I don't know, but I think we need to wait for the Japanese stuff to become available before we can 
I mean, essentially, the thing about that two two people on the list, I mean, it just comes down to plot, really, doesn't it? It's yeah, down but to it's, that we it, need it for necessity's purpose. But it's such a coincidence. It's it could have saved a lot of hassle, really, by just not having Moira's bracelet be red in the extra chapter, or not even having her be buried under a pile of rubble, but being separated some other way. Exactly. That's... Yeah. All right then. So Barry's Barry's was obviously a lot longer. We start. Where do we start off? We start off at the dam, don't we? Well, you get the cutscene first of Claire. Oh, yeah, yeah. The hospital bed. Yeah, that was quite good. No answer on how the hell she gets there, though. It's like someone has evidently gone in and rescued her, but that, yet yeah, it takes Barry six months to find the island. Mm. So what, she's just washed through the ocean and just rolled up on a shore somewhere. One would assume some sort of ship came across it, but it, again, not yeah. explained at all. Like, Yeah. Without knowing like, about the extra chapter, would either of you have believed Moira to be dead? No. Well, because I got the bad bad ending, which well, I'll get into as I was fucking wild about when, when that happened. Uh, yeah, for a part of me, I mean, I knew Capcom wouldn't pull through it at the end of the day, but I wasn't sure what they would do with her. But then I, I think I did say in the last, uh, the last one, I thought it would probably end with her having the persona of Alex. All right, then. So Barry wakes up near the dam. Did any of you think at that point that Alex had taken over Natalia or not? Yeah, I think I did. I, I wasn't sure either way. I take it we're assuming Alex retreated because she saw her own reflection in Natalia's eyes. When uh, episode 3 ending first rolled around, I thought they were, had done a body swap. And uh, it was actually... I thought they were going to be stupid enough to do that. And it was actually Natalia inside the, the body of Alex, which is why she gets frightened and, and runs away. Yeah, there's not really explained why Alex flees. It only actually becomes more confusing by the time you get to later in the fourth episode like because obviously there's so much like alex is aware of this whole false alex so why would she be freaked out by this when confronting natalia is exactly what she wanted to do the whole time like the, the files and the, the taunting and all that obviously tells you as much like it's yeah it's slightly contradictory well did she realize when she sort of had hold of her that her consciousness had been duplicated and that's when she realized the plan hadn't worked in that it just created a copy rather than transferred her across maybe but it still continues to be like the taunting at the end of the fourth episode it's not consistent to that idea that's that's the problem like i could understand that if that was the case but Mm. so gameplay wise then we start off going through the water treatment bit and then the crane was anyone else disappointed by the sluice gate thing because i was hoping it was going to lead to a completely different route and it's literally just to help you get one of the extra insect lava things yeah and a trophy how did you get on with the crane puzzle? Pretty it's straightforward. Just, it's not particularly taxing once you've worked it, out where you can go and, and stand and move your way through it, but it, it's just so boring. It just seems more complex than it, than it actually is, I think, but it's just, yeah, it's a bit slow. I mean, there's the, once you know how to do it, and there's a one of the medals, obviously, to do it in three moves or less. Once you know how to do that, it's reasonably easy, but it's still... Mm. And then the we get down into the mines, and then there's the, the gas. Ugh. <sighs> Was there really any need for it? No, it was just padding. It was just literally making the episode longer. Yeah. Especially considering you it can extract... It's like the whole point of the extraction of the fans is so you can get further down, but of course it should extract the gas from the entire area so that if you do that first, mm. you shouldn't have to worry about it anymore, but no. Because it's not really even tied into the plot, is it? I thought it might have been done deliberately to sort of kill all the workers, but I think a file explains it was a natural occurrence. Yeah, something to do with faults in the ground and yeah. natural gas. Yeah. Where do we go after that? Is it the mansion after that? Yeah. Yep. Let's go down the elevator. Yeah. The, so, the big bowl of soup. Yeah. So what did yes. you think of the uh, the mansion? I thought it was good. You know, is it obviously a throwback and uh, an Easter egg of sorts? But it looked pretty good. Um, it was just far too small. Had plenty of bathrooms. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, made up for long lost lack of bathrooms throughout the series. I, I think the interesting thing is that each area seemed to be reminiscent of different games. Did anyone else think this? Like, you walk through that access way outside with the brick, kind of reminds me of bits of Resident Evil 5, then inside there's someone, I think it was SG on Biohaz, made a comment about reusing textures from Remake. Mm. But then the, the area where you go get the level 2 key, I think it is, there's that kind of a wall with the bars kind of reminds me of the areas from Resident Evil 4 then there's a desk that kind of looks like the one from the RPD in Resident Evil 2 
Mm. Bizarrely, one of the side Ooh. stairwells reminded me of uh, the Apple Inn from Outbreak. <laughs> it could it could be intentional. I I mean I don't know. If some of these things obviously are actually recycled, and, but some of them obviously can't be because I mean the the thing in Res- the desk thing, the circular kind of desk thing from Resident Evil Two, obviously wasn't unless they used the Dark Side Chronicles version of it. But I mean yeah, the the, the different areas obviously just definitely remind me. And then obviously the emblem key doorways are a bit like the ones in Code Veronica. So, I mean, yeah, I think it was all very intentional, aside from obviously along with the idea of just having a mansion. But they didn't have a hall, which was good, like we were making the jokes last time about them having a hall, but yeah, you know, just had an entrance. Eerie corridor. Mm. It looked great as well. It was one of the better looking areas, visually. And then at the bottom of the mansion, we had the, the lab with all the Ouroboros experiments going on. A little bit of key questing, which was quite good. Yeah, I was going to say the two keys, the blue and red keys, were another throwback to a certain extent, the uh, Resident Evil 2 mm. police station keys. And then uh, then final boss time with Alex. I mean, how did you how did you think that played out? I found it slightly underwhelming. I mean, the first time I got the bad ending, so you just had the first part of it. Mm. Um, and I went back and replayed it. But, I mean, I just found, compared to the Neil fight, it's kind of underwhelming, I think. She's quite susceptible to being knocked over quite easily, and you just basically, if you've got any ammo, you just plug away at her quite rapidly. I mean, it was the idea of being able to not get damaged and kind of moving around and having the shelves in the way worked really well, but I didn't find it overly challenging. The second time round, obviously, when I went back and actually played it, obviously added to it, but I think maybe we'll talk about that separately because it's much different. It was just a bit of an in terms of the what you had to do. It was just it was just a bullet sponge that you just had to fire at a lot of times wasn't it there wasn't really much in the way of strategy mm. and there was the weak point on the neck but I suppose it was kind of interesting the way she kept using the ventilation ducts but it, it was just like an, an akin to whack a mole the design of her was, was suitably creepy it was slightly on. confusing too though I, I just don't get the addition the kind of robotic additions I guess they're a little bit weird I don't yeah the lead up to it though was quite atmospheric she was coming across on the bracelet and you found the the lottie bear on the rock yeah impaled that was quite good I thought and all the dolls and... yeah and why was there a big piano in the last room I was a little bit confused by that as well I was just sitting in the middle I thought if you zoomed in on the notes it might be like Moonlight Sonata <laughs> on there or something but no like so the extended ending then what did you think of the sort of switching between Claire and Barry to kill her off in the end did you think that worked or not or was it a bit too clunky I just quite liked it as a as a final set piece. I actually thought it used the the switching element quite well. I, I actually thought it was a very very good, you know in the in the history of the sort of final set pieces. I thought it was one of the more positive ones actually. And what about Barry's endless references about you know <laughs> let me take care of this and I'll have this and was all that really necessary? Probably not. But it was there anyway. <laughs> I found the idea. I mean, I, I much agree. I mean, it wasn't as far as final boss fights go in recent memory. It was pretty good. I, I only found it slightly clunky when it would switch, go inside the tunnel, it switch back. You couldn't tell which way was up, kind of almost like Barry being near a wall, and you couldn't see which way the tunnel was going to be until the camera kind of swung around in your light, and she's already behind you, like whacking you over, and the hell's going on. But I mean, other than that, it was fine. And, it, and of course it ended with the old rocket launcher cliche but was... so satisfying conclusion overall but yeah I think in terms of for a final boss I think Alex is dispatch very you know quite well in terms of the set piece it's quite good I think Claire's return is quite triumphant although was she just flying around the island for three hours just waiting for a cliff for them all to pop out of dressed as Ada Wong from Resident <laughs> Evil 6 look suits her though but yeah, the, the post credit scene then. I mean, Do you think Capcom have done it intentionally to bring Alex back, or do you think it's more of like a red herring that they're just going to endlessly tease? Well, when we get into the sort of aspects of that plan uh, more in depth, uh, the thing is, I was saying all along since the Alex thing came about was that they're doing this to give closure on that plot line, and then they go and do that. Hmm. You know, uh, they had a good opportunity for sort of finishing that Alex chapter and, and then the Wesker children's all done and now they're kind of artificially stretching it but what is important to remember and I keep trying to stress this to people is that Natalia is not Alex Alex is dead what exists in Natalia is like a copy the transference thing or whatever Alex tried to do it did not work and all it did was create like 
a persona of Alex, but it's not Alex. Mm. That's what people need to remember. It's not going to retain all her memories. Well, I like to think it's not anyway. Mm. You came all this way just to say goodbye. Oh, I'm touched. It's already done. I've conquered fear and earned the right to become a god. Come out from behind that glass so I can choke a god. All that remains is one final test. One last threshold to cross. Is she even listening to us? My brother's escape was death. And soon, it will be mine as well. I will share in his fate, and then I will surpass him. What are you trying to do? Escape. In a weird way, it's sort of similar with what happened to Carla in Resident Evil 6, isn't it? Yeah, it's very similar, yeah. But I must admit, the first the first time I did it, I had to take a step back. I mean, I couldn't comment on the forums for a few days because <laughs> it, it was just such a strange experience being finally introduced to Alex Wesker, only for her to shoot herself in the head. And then the very next level, I'm hunting rabbits with a machine gun in the woods. Yeah, you did it like that, did you? You played the... Yeah, and it's... The struggle. It, it, just, it was just weird, but upon reflection, it's... It's not too bad, but I just get the feeling that it's just been done as an intentional red herring, you know, so endless threads will be created of, is she Alex, is she not Alex? I don't think Capcom is seriously going to bring her back. Uh, I don't know, because, I, I mean, sometimes they do bring back the weird things. The thing that makes me think about it more is that, obviously, there was that discussion about whether or not there's going to be more Revelations 2 episodes, because there was that whole leaked DLC, and there was, like, folders set up for different Episodes. Yeah, up, and, up to eleven or something, isn't that? Yeah, and I and I could easily believe that, given the generally positive reviews and the fact it's probably sold reasonably well, that yeah, they would definitely consider if there's a reason to extend the plot line out that includes the story continuing, they might do so. I know some people have said like the problem, I guess, is that she's got to grow up and blah blah blah, but I, I don't think that's quite necessarily true. I mean, you can still have something be revealed. At, and it could be only a month later, I, I suspect. But, yeah, I'll wait and see. I mean, I thought it was a nice touch that she was reading the newspaper article on Tall Oaks. That sort of triggered a, a memory to start reading the Kafka book. I don't know if that was... Well, maybe it's just a coincidence, I don't know. But some people have thought it was the Tall Oaks incident that's first ignited Alex's personality. Perhaps, yeah. It's possible, yeah, I could easily see that as a potential. I mean, I think perhaps more the idea was it was just more scene setting for time frame and reference and stuff, but it could easily be that as well. So, is she going to start building a lab in, in Barry's shed? <laughs> in, Barry's, in Barry's garden shed. Start experimenting on the neighbourhood animals or something? I mean, you know, we <laughs> joked about the likes of Ark Thompson coming back, but I think that was more likely than, than Alex Wesker living with Barry Burton and his family. Yeah, definitely didn't see that one coming. I don't know, like you say, it could be an intentional red herring, I guess. My sense is it probably should be, but I, for some reason, don't feel like it is. I feel like they'll do something with it. It's too important to have put into an extra cutscene after the... It's like the Marvel films, you know, you add that post-coda sequence yeah. because it sets up what's going to happen next. It's too important not to. Someone did have a theory that the Revelations games are all going to converge in 7. You know, the, the T-Abyss, Vespa, Jessica, this now with Alex all tying up. You know, but I don't know. We, we've said this before. Every time, and every time a new number title comes along, we say this is the one. This is the one that's going to answer the questions. Oh, it's what we yeah, but you just get more questions than answers most of the time. And it's the same as I said. We talked. I talked about it before. It's the it's like Sonic side, but with Resident Evil fans, it's just <laughs> predictions, hoping it's this. These are all the untied loose ends that we need to work out. These things will all connect together, and then it's none of those at all. It just. <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, I will say no part of this game was predictable for me. I had no idea what was going to happen. Before we played this game, we did a Lost in Nightmares podcast, which sort of set the story up for this game. Yeah. And really, has it answered anything? Because some form of Alex Wesker is still out there. 
it gave us who Alex Wesker was. It gave us a little bit more motivation mm. for her specifically, um, and it set up what's at the end. I mean, that's basically it. I mean, well, uh, I, I do think it gave us what she thought the immortality virus was, and for her, that was finding a new host, a young host, yeah, and then transferring yourself across, so you, then you live on as a new body. But it catastrophically fails. You're perfect. <laughs> Six months from now, you're going to awaken as me. And the world is going to be very afraid. So good night, my darling. Sleep well. All this time wasted. My whole life has been a prelude to this. My true birth. I think catastrophically failed is incorrect. Because on some level it kind of worked, just not the way that she intended. That doesn't yeah. make it a catastrophic failure, it just makes it a failure in the way that she expected it to work. When she shoots herself, I'm seeing that as the moment when she's expected to be. Yeah. Shifted across, isn't she? Yeah. yeah. But I suppose we can say, yeah, there wasn't literally an immortality virus, was there? I can't remember how Spencer words it. Does he actually refer to it as a virus, or he, well, he, he's unlocked he, the key or something? He just says, Alex has sent me a report of success. So he believes the virus has been completed, but I've always believed that she was just bluffing him, really. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think it was yeah. a bluff, or that she was she had made a decision on what she had found, which was far more interesting research. Because there's obviously that file that explains there's someone who's come up with this idea of how it's going to work, and and, and she was excited about it and mm. put, made him head researcher and stuff. It's unfortunately it's just like that consistency of what we've talked about before. There's a lot of in some ways there's a lot of detail, and a lot of ways there's a lot of vague information given. So as to how this has been done and what yeah it is is not. A perfect example of that is the cough Alex does. Mm. Because I said before, I mean, she's obviously relatively quite young. She has to have superior genetics because she's already survived the experimental virus that Wesker took. So where's this urgent need to transfer herself into another vessel? And now we get this implied illness that, well, I don't know, she could maybe even be dying. But, you know, there's no follow-up to that. There's no files that explain it or anything. Is that potentially a side effect of not receiving PG-7? Well, we just don't know, do we? It would make sense that if she if she does have some kind of illness, that would explain the urgency, because there's a few files where she alludes to, you know, running out of time and things. But it's just annoying just how vague it all is. Because yeah. you'd literally just get doing that one cough. There's no other evidence in the entire game that there's anything wrong with her. And that's, that's, yeah. I think that's a problem throughout with the files we get, because there's some fantastic detail in there. But at the same time, it's like we don't really get any new information on the Wesker program. We just no, get no, no. we just get repeated information about how Spencer failed and how bitter he was and, and all that. The only and then, and, bit you get uh, is the fact that they knew each other. Yeah, um, which still, again, is slightly vague as well. We don't know details about... Obviously, we talked about this before, but the idea that there were so, all these people running around with the last name Wesker. I mean... There was obviously some sort of cover-up or uh, mm. information not provided and the, the two met somehow, because the photo's not explained either. It's like, there's a photo to make the reveal, which is all exciting, but then, yeah, no information about that is, mm. is provided. And then also Alex seems to have like quite a, an understanding or at least a thought of understanding what Albert was going through in regards to the events that are in five, but where that information comes from, we have no specific idea and, and that, at that level of detail. Like, she seems to have this good understanding of this is what he wanted and this is what he... It's not. That's not true. <laughs> it's probably not true at all. Like, she has probably no clue. Like, mm. <laughs> she's going to be taking guesses. Do you think a resurrection was down to just the T4 boss virus or do you think it had something to do with the Wesker virus she had? Because oh, she, she, she mentions, doesn't she, that Albert's rebirth was literally when he died and came back to life again. Which is what's happened to her, isn't it? Yeah. But the T4 boss virus mutated her instead. We have to assume now that when she took the Wesker virus, she just simply survived it. She hasn't gained any benefits like Wesker did. We never see whether she gained any abilities or anything, do we? Yeah. We'd have, right. we'd have to assume that she didn't. But yeah, I mean, obviously, so it's pretty clear-cut that she 
mutates because she feels fear, doesn't she, at the time she shoots herself. I think that's pretty clear. She even says that in one of the files, I think. And she's probably not used to Moira and Claire confronting her because she assumes they died in the factory explosion. Well, does she, though? Because the, the bracelets... Oh, course, have, yeah. I think it's just Claire and Moira assume that she thinks they've died. Yeah, I, I didn't think that was going to work. I was like, you're going through a facility that you she's been watching you on cameras just because you assume that the section that you're going through in the sewers isn't doesn't mean you're not going to turn up to an area that has cameras in it. I'm just, I would be fairly certain that when they got to the bottom of the tower and there's the big fight with Neil, like there's cameras around that area. It's the bottom of the tower where she's her lab and living quarters are. So she would probably be able to see that there was something not going on. I think that's and, part of the reason she infected yeah. Neil anyway, was to set Neil on Claire and Moira. It's like an insurance policy almost. But then, uh, they, again, certain, there's a certain jump to conclusion to make that assumption as well. But then but there's also the problem that she's just going to leave this guy who's mutating at the bottom of the tower to, to do what? Like, <laughs> he's just there. It's like, oh, that's going to take care of him. Or wait, hang on, he's stampeding around the bottom of my base, like smashing into stuff. <laughs> yeah. All right, then. So there's two extra episodes. The first one is called The Struggle with Moira who has somehow been rescued from the top of the tower by the old Russian guy. What did you think about it? I mean, for me, I thought it was quite interesting because it's, it was essentially like a mini-game, like Operation Mad Jackal from Resident Evil 3, but they tied it into the story. But I think the problem they made was Capcom advertised it as like an extra story episode when it really wasn't. Yeah. Mm. It is just a series of like raid mode style challenges, isn't it? Yeah. Having said Sit that, I thought it was some of the best writing in the game, though. It's very good. The cutscenes, I think, are brilliant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I think the storyline between them is quite human and, and very good, and I think it ends on a really, really good note with him locking himself away. Mm. But the gameplay is just horrible. I actually think it's not possible in survival mode, because the, the fucking sewer level is un, unbearable. You just run out of ammo so fast. I played it on not on the survival mode thing, but the next one down, the normal normal casual no normal mode, and I just didn't like the one on the fishing village where you can't get seen. It was just oh yeah, that's hard. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculously ridiculously impossible because they manage to see through gaps and you get caught. It's like it's not fun. I think you've already made the comment about going from playing the game and what you expected to hunting rabbits with a machine gun. Oh, yeah, it was just, it was just <laughs> such, such a strange experience. That whole thing was just a, a throwback to bloody Last of Us again, because mm. there's a moment where you have to go um, hunting as Ellie when she becomes separated from Joel, and she goes out and she... Uh, Same with Tomb Raider as well, the Tomb Raider remake in 2013. Yeah. There's a bit near the start of the game, you have to go hunt deer or something. And the only other level is Little Miss where Natalia wakes up and is constantly battling with dark Natalia, who is Alex's personality. For me, the interaction between the two of them was quite good, but like you say, the level itself was just really frustrating because the revenants could just see you when you, you know, you're perfectly hidden. There's no way they could see you, and somehow they just do, and it just becomes too frustrating to enjoy. It does, I, mean, I like the mechanic that dark Natalia can't be seen, so you can do a lot of scouting and stuff and it doesn't matter but why did they make it as soon as you spotted it's game over it would have been better if they chased you I mean obviously they can't show you show them brutally killing a small girl but they could have just had it where like they grab you and it goes to a game over they should have given you a chance to actually escape but it just became just so frustrating the story I mean it's not really much story the concept that drives the narrative's interesting because it's it's an interesting way of presenting it but i just found myself just being bored by the whole process it's just there's no fun in it it was just like oh so i'm basically just stealth game through these areas and the areas i've already been to but i'm not really doing anything interesting in them except for like moving through them where do you get the um files for the bonus there isn't any it's just the postcards from lottie oh right okay so obviously natalia must have been asleep in that tube for six months so why hasn't Alex just gone down there and killed her? Because it takes six months for Alex to recover. Again much like the whole all of a sudden she's got like implanted bits of machinery or something I don't know what. There's no explanation (laughs) but I mean there's been lots of things that didn't make sense one of the things that people have been talking about is at the end the idea that we talked about with Barry turning up in in advance of the BSAA uh, invading or firebombing the island or something 
seems to actually kind of correspond to the way the ending works where they, there's people flying past as they're leaving um, so it kind of does imply somewhat that Barry wanted to get there before something else before something happened he didn't have a chance to find out what happened to his daughter but nothing specifically said about it and it's much in the same way like lots of these things are like you can then just assume or jump to a conclusion about it I just wondered because I think the whole reason Alex releases Ouroboros across the island is, is for the revenants to hunt down and kill Natalia when really surely she must know where she is if she's sleeping in that thing for six months just go down and kill her you think that she's almost thinking that she's already out on the island and hiding somewhere or something it's weird I don't know. well the hallucination stuff is quite weird because I do actually think she's progressing as well isn't she when she snaps out of it she is on the beach mm. and she sees Barry arriving what do we think of it then as an overall package some people are saying it's like the best Resident Evil game since the end of the classic era since sort of Code Veronica time would you agree with that or do you think people are still getting a bit carried away because it is a new title and it's fresh in everyone's heads because a lot of people praised Revelations 1 in the sort of the weeks well, following its release me and you are, are, in particular John we were quite vocal about how we felt about Revelations after the series playthrough uh, I don't think it's aged very well at all I don't think there's a problem with this one. I think this is better in every single way to Revelations. It is the game Revelations should have been. It fills in, you know, nice little chunks of backstory. Uh, it has, you know, fan favourite moments. It does everything a sort of spin-off title should do. I do like a lot of the set pieces. It did remember its horror roots in some places. And as a nice little package, I think it, it did the job it set out to do. I wouldn't quite go as far as to say it's the best game since the, you know, the 90s, but because I still hold five on a high pedestal for its story. It's interesting. I think part of it is still that, yeah, it's fresh and new and people might be a little bit too gung-ho keen on it, then that might dull a little bit over time. My other concern with it is also that, aside from, obviously, the remake HD version, a lot of people are coming straight off the back of six. The comparison between this and six is that this is definitely much better as well. Like, I think between the, between those two things... It's hard. I see positives, I see negatives. I think this might be the standard that the main series goes for as far as other games and go on from now on. Because it's that level of still having action, but still having a bit of survival horror roots. Not exactly complete of either one, but with pacing and more characterization and a little bit of self-reference and being able to be making good use of the existing kind of history and lore of the of the series but I don't I'm definitely not going to say it's the best since blah I mean it's pr- probably to be fair I'd say it's the best since Lost in Nightmares mm. because I like Lost in Nightmares it was good but I mean it's better than, better than 6 5 is kind of indifferent like depends on which elements I mean I didn't like the action gameplay of 5 but I definitely liked the story and the graphics and it were nice and all that sort of stuff but I mean, my, for me, the, it's hard because, well, because there's a separation of the franchise because everything that's kind of between the start of the franchise in 1996 and when Resident Evil 4 came out is kind of one set of games, and then everything from Resident Evil 4 onwards is kind of another set of games. So I can only judge it on the newer set, and in the newer set, it's, it's pretty good. It's not the best, but it's definitely improved. I liked it more than Revelations 1, yeah. and I think a lot of that comes to do with better pacing and... Um, not forcing that bottleneck thing all the time and a more straightforward story which was just kind of more interesting yeah I mean they've definitely learned a lesson from 6 haven't they there was no... we'd hope so yeah, <laughs> all, the yeah problem, would... all the problems in that game weren't just not present in here I would say it's been that is completely addressed now the, the issues of 6 I mean there's still there's still some way to go you know it, it's not the stunning return to form but it is a return to form I would say it's definitely a step in the right direction but they can't get complacent they need to build on it now and still move away from uh, you know having stupid timed sections in warehouses that are on fire which end in a fiery explosion which propel them out of windows and stuff it's just you know they need to move away from that more fishing villages in the dark as I said I, I think this is more of a roadmap for where potentially the main games of the series will go and spin-offs will continue to be kind of more interesting or different and I mean Revelations 2 is a sequel to Revelations in a, in a broad sense it's not just by name but it, there's connective tissue but there's also that idea of this of certain things to be expected of it and so that doesn't stop them from creating other games with an entirely different focus better another first-person shooter or 
anything like that but i would kind of also would like them to do a set, subset again that's more maybe more classic survival horror and just see how it goes after how well the remake was received for example but again i would probably judge that quite differently because i know what it's trying to be as opposed to revelations that's why i kind of i can't turn around and go this is the best thing since Resident Evil 2 or Resident Evil Co-Veronica or Zero or whatever because they're, they're entirely different games. They're not, they're not supposed to be the same. Mm. And the franchise is so different and moved on in that 10, 15 plus year frame. Safe to say, so that, though, since the torrid year of 2012 that we had for the franchise, 2015 has, has got off to a, a good start. It's a, it's a year of healing. <laughs> Realistically, though, I mean, how much longer can we go on for? I mean, do you think Capcom, <laughs> do you think Capcom are really just going to run it into the ground? Because... I don't know, because because I, you know, I'm, I'm on board again. <laughs> totally inspired to do a series playthrough again. And I mean, as, as, as good done as it every time I think I'm done, they do it again. As good as this game was, we're still sort of stuck in the same situation we were in 2012. In that, <laughs> I know. you know, the story and the characters aren't going anywhere. I mean, I read, a, I read, I don't know if you, if you guys visit AV Club, but they've also got their game section, and I saw that they'd, they'd done a, a review of the first episode, and then they did a review of just the series. The title, Resident Evil Revelations 2, finds a soap opera in the series Recycled Parts. Mm-hmm. And so basically it talks about the idea that the plot is quite, is conducive to the idea of a soap opera. And I mean, I've seen other people saying the whole soap opera thing, and it's kind of, the more I think about it, it's kind of true. It's like the evil twin sister, you know, it's not exactly a twin in this case. It, it's not blood linked but it's still it is that sort of cheesy thing and, it, and we've kind of been circling the strain of the same kind of elements yeah what else can we talk about secret that's... files what did you think of them I thought they were disappointing really I, I like them for their easter eggs but that's mainly what they were for weren't they they were just you know here's a damnation reference uh, here's a here's a here's a Jill reference oh, you know you want, you want you want a Piers reference here you go very disappointing compared to the ones in Resident Evil 5 I was waiting for, like, a whole Alex biography and, you know, what's Barry been doing for the last 15 years and, you know, things like that. And I don't want an email from Barry to Chris saying, D- don't go to the gym, you'll get a bad back. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 Rob, you weren't joking when you said the uh, Capcom guy said to you they've left uh, Barry's background deliberately vague. I mean, you, you got a little bit of his family. You know he's been in Canada. You know he's done something with being a, a consultant for the BSAA. And he's had daughter problems, and that's about it. That's <laughs> and then and then the events obviously in the game. Though I mean that's not surprising. I mean it's nice to get details where possible, but at the same time, if they're trying to set up things for later and they don't want to have to constantly cross reference or write themselves into even more of a corner than they they are going to keep those certain things vague. It's unfortunate. I mean, some of these things could be better explained, especially in the game, especially stuff to do with Alex. could probably be quite easily explained a lot more, but I can also kind of see why you wouldn't. I was going to say, see if this, uh, this guidebook really does shed any more light on. I can't see it, though, for it, person. I mean, I know we've sort of got the cliffhanger ending, but do you think we've finally left all the Wesker stuff behind now? No. <laughs> I'm that certain of it. I mean, I said that to him before. I mean, the, the the whole point of putting that coda sequence in post credits is intentionally to set to leave something open in the air. And, oh, and as we've just talked talked about as well, leaving things vague is a, a, the same reason as well. You know what they're gonna do, don't you? They're gonna do a Resident Evil. 2050 or whatever where uh, Jill and Chris's daughter has to fight you know an older Natalia well they are sort of setting it up lasers because we've got we've got Jake and Sherry and who were in their early 20s and now we've got a villain who's what 11 years old <laughs> So uh, yeah, it could go for another fifty years. Uh, and I was going to say, I know you guys, I know you guys, you know, enjoy talking to to DC, but the fact that he stays in such good contact with people at Capcom, and they know the fans like him, and they know the fans like you know Albert Wesker, that only gives them more incentive to potentially try and find a way to bring him back. How they must be lamenting that decision to kill him <laughs> off. Oh, I'm sure they are, but at the same time, there's always, I mean, it's. The way the series has gone, I mean, they they could find a reason, and we'd all be like, "Well, that was ridiculous." 
but it still happened anyway, so I mean, we'll just have to deal with it. If someone played through this series chronologically who's never played it before, they'd get to Resident Evil 5 and think, oh yeah, we've reached the end now, we've killed Wesker, all is well in the world, and then the very next game, it's Wesker's hypothetical sister. Well, it's not even the next <laughs> game, then, it's just the DLC, yeah. and then like, and then, oh, there was more of them. And then the game after that, it's Wesker's son, you know. They didn't save face by having Jake be Alex's son. Oh, I'm sure them theories will come about now. <laughs> Give it time. And again, another reason to keep this whole how they met in that photo back. Yeah. <laughs> oh god, that, that yeah, it is, isn't it? Alex and Albert is the father, so it's an incestuous sort of <laughs> oh. illegitimate son. So final overall um, conclusions. Then is it fair to say it's better than what we all expected, but it's not spectacular? I'm very positive about it. I enjoy it a lot, actually. I wrote it off before I'd even played it, and it corrected me. And I, I think very warmly about it looking back now. I'm very pleased with it, despite some of the issues. And I'll just quickly say, and I'm only going to be brief, but fucking Capcom and fucking bad endings. <laughs> God, I was wild that night. Because I've, I've had very little limited time to play because of work commitments and things like that. So I've been having to play at like 11 at night. And it got to about 1 o'clock in the morning and I just finished a fucking bad ending and I, I had no time to play for the rest of the week and I knew we were recording so I, I decided to watch the good ending on YouTube but then the next night my schedule opened up and I was able to play it properly and I just I was so angry at myself for uh, spoiling that moment because I could think the set piece does work well but of course I'd seen it all on the YouTube video first so the character swapping and stuff and the Claire reveal wasn't new for me and I just think you know Capcom ruined that moment for me just for a fucking non-canon ending on, on an arbitrary moment whether you choose Claire or Moira to dispatch Neil is invalid the game should progress the same regardless of who you choose it's just such a bollocks moment I see narratively where it makes sense but yeah it's, it's a very vague explanation as to why it changes the ending as far as the gameplay element goes and the fact that you then realise what's wrong I mean at least yeah the annoying thing is if you want to change it you have to go back and play clear I mean, episode 3 and then Barry so episode 4 is it assumed then that because you chose to face Natalia's fear and use the gun that she's actually able to overcome the mutation and survive. Is that is that what Capcom are implying? No, it's it's the fact that Moira overcame her fear of using a gun in for a purpose and shooting something that allows her to survive the, the at the end. I guess I don't get why it changes things. It just does. It's just nonsense. It's just a stupid branched path that they can put in to prolong I'm, replayability. If it, if it wasn't for the buried under concrete thing, I could understand that the survival instinct has come out on the idea that she fought back and used a gun and then she uses the gun and hunts rabbits and all that sort of carry on and then comes in and, you know, at the right time because she's there. But it, yeah, other than that, it doesn't make any sense. That was actually one thing I going to say before is with the cutscenes, the CG cutscenes, especially the last, the two for both the good and the bending were very, very good quality i was quite impressed with the for, for a game that hasn't had much of budget in the gameplay visuals the effects work in those were very very good i just quickly say as well moira grew on me quite a lot by the end and i, and I thought she redeemed herself as a character and now that you've played the full game what did you think of barry overall he was recognized i mean we've already talked about claire but do you think barry's still the same old barry more or less yeah it's hard. I mean, I, I, we talked about this much earlier on. Uh, the, the, uh, there's the juxtaposition between the type of Barry it's supposed to be. Is it supposed to be the Barry that was in the original PlayStation version who spouted off really weird lines because of mistranslation, but they've become like fan favorites? Or is it supposed to be the slightly more serious and kind of sad Barry from the remake? I mean, you talk to some people, like News Boss, perfect example, he's, he's like, it's all non, there's no canon to it, so it doesn't matter which version it is because it's still the same Barry. And it's like, well, that's not the same. That, <laughs> there's, there's truth to what he's saying, but at the same time, there's a personality that has to come through, and which personality does it match to? Well, it's probably closer to the one in the PlayStation original, but is that the better version of, as a character? I don't know. Mm. So. I don't know if I have an answer for you. As a character in the game, he's pretty well realised. He's, um, but that's the thing across the board, I think, and that's the same thing that has to do with with Moira as well. Is like the characters are pretty surprisingly, aside from translation issues or whatever, the characters are relatable, well written, fully realised characters. 
which the series hasn't always managed to pull off, and I think that's probably one of its biggest successes, actually, and is, is just how the characters come across as, as the different chapters go on. I think it's definitely worth saying as a follow-up to that. Is if nothing else that the series does, it, ha- it has great characters. Even even in the darkest moments of the series in six, there were still great interactions between some characters. Some great moments, you know, like the bit with Sherry discussing Jake about Leon and Claire and stuff. It has those moments. Hmm. I think I think in a nutshell for me the whole game the relations to it has been has been a bit of a roller coaster. There's been some very high highs and very low lows, and I'm pleasantly surprised that it was better than I was expecting as well. But yeah, I still is also see potential for them to continue kind of improving. Do you think the episodic release helped at all, or do we still think it was pointless? I think it was brilliant. I, you know, and I, and I hate digital distribution. I've said this uh, probably every episode of this cast, but I actually have enjoyed having like two-hour slices every week for the last four weeks. It's been great. Oh, on that level, it's, I've enjoyed it as well. Like it's nice to sit down and have a, have two to three hour kind of segments but at the same time I don't I still don't understand the idea of releasing them one week apart it could have been a month apart and it, and it probably would have still been the same in my mindset it would have been once a month I sat down and played you know, three hours or whatever and for the purposes of what we've been doing talking every week it's kind of been good because it's kind of added more interest to it as well in that sense of play for a couple of hours during the week talk about it and do it again but if I was just playing it on a week to week basis, I might either A be really impatient about what having to wait for the next chunk to come down, or B just stop caring. <laughs> like I think not saying that I would have, but there is that possibility. If I was just a regular gamer, I might just be like played the first episode and went, eh, it was okay, but I'm not really fussed. I mean there's I think lots of people it, there who waited for the whole series as well. I think if it had been a month apart it would have gone off the boil. I think you sort of replayed all you could do, got the secret files and that, and then you wouldn't have played it, I think. I think you wouldn't have played it for probably like three weeks. Would two weeks, like the mid-ground of that, like not every week, but every fortnight, might have been a... Possibly, yeah. So over, so basically they released the entire four episodes over two months. Or than a chapter a week. <laughs> Although that would have made uh, Claire 4 quite short. <laughs> I guess it depends on how much you play raid mode. I mean, I don't personally. I haven't played it, but... No, I haven't touched it. But there's a lot, obviously, I understand there's a lot of depth in it. It's just not my interest, really. But there's still plenty of time to get under your skin. And next time, you won't see me coming. Okay, folks, that brings us to a lovely conclusion to our first ever kind of prediction podcast. I hope you've all had uh, some time to digest all these wildly inaccurate and on the fence, however, predictions, both Batman and George and Star's Tyrant and Rombi, slightly off with some of their predictions, but generally uh, an, an interesting experiment. Whether Capcom will repeat it remains to be seen with this kind of episodic release. We'll see. And um, if they do, I'm, sh- I'm sure we'll have another go at doing it. Perhaps we may release them as the game gets released as well, as opposed to one big segment. No quiz, I'm afraid, quiz fans. We're still working on the next one. <laughs> uh, but do not fear, do not panic. We will be back for a full-blown episode 28 when everyone should be returning and we'll have the news quiz and we'll be discussing at length Resident Evil Revelations 2 will allow probably a good couple of weeks for everything to be digested so that I can bring my uh, own thoughts to the panel as well as I've just picked up the disc release games so uh, we can we can all discuss my views and hopefully Mr. Spencer's views as well oh yes he could be back so in honour of the latest BBC news on that bombshell, it's uh, goodbye from me and it's goodbye from everyone else and we will see you shortly.